Hello, nerds. Ooh, thank you for the five gifted member chips. Um, nom, 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 nom. Thank you, Sanders. Hi, are you guys ready to nerd it up? I know you are, you bunch of dweebs. <laughs> All right, let's climb our ways, uh, our way out of the uh, the lockers that we got shoved in or whatever. Make our way to the, uh, the mom's basement, and we're gonna play some D and D. I hope you brought the uh, the Funyuns and the Mountain Dew. <laughs> you know the classic D and D snacks: Funyuns, Mountain Dew, and pizza. You brought the dice? Listen, that'll count, that'll count, that'll count. All right, one second. I have got to swap us over to this scene. I hope everything's working right. We're gonna find out in just a second. Wait a second. Too loud. Too loud. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah, there we go. I think I got it. I think I got it. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, nice. So there are gonna be a couple times where I turn and I face over here, and you're gonna you're gonna see me kind of blank out for a second. Um don't worry too much about that. That's just me uh, really focusing, okay? So we all agree, if I suddenly just stop moving when I'm looking this way and I'm still talking, it's because I'm a very good ventriloquist and I'm focusing. Got it? Got it. It's kind of a weird setup. The uh, dice are behind me back here, like I'm reaching backwards right now, but we'll be okay. We'll be okay. Cool? Cool. So that way we have dice and I can roll dice, and I can explain a couple things to you. So what I'm going to start with is, one, I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, first of all, d d is product of, uh, you know, Wizards of the Coast, etc., etc. I don't own anything, blah, 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 blah. You understand that. Secondarily, the music we're going to be listening to, listening to today uh, belongs to Adrian Von Ziegler, who is a very, very talented... Uh, musical artist who makes a lot of different types of music, Celtic music, uh, folk music, things like that. Uh, I really encourage you to check out his other work. Uh, it's just really good music in general, but it definitely hits those D&D vibes, like right, right on the head, nail on the head, boom. Okay, cool. So now then, now that we did that, you're right, it's a nerdy setup as well it should be. I even I even snuck my little, my little bone knife in here. You wanna see this? Check this out, hold on one second. Let me just, let me just, uh, ooh, I knocked that over. Please show us all of your dice. My dice addiction needs all the sets you have. I have too many sets to show you all at once. Here, check this little guy out. My little bone knife. I mean, I guess it's like, at that point, it's almost becoming like, that's getting pretty close to, that. that's past knife, right? Like, that's a dagger, no? More or less. Like, that is no longer a knife, but that's okay. Compared to the length of my hand, that's a little silly, but that's okay. That was a gift. I like it. It's fancy. Anyway, I knocked over my little dragon. I'm sorry, little green dragon. Hold on, bud. Get back up there. There you go. Put you right here. Right here? Right here. I don't know where I want you. Maybe you go in the dice button? No. All right. He'll, he'll be right over here for now. That's fine. He can stay behind you guys. He'll keep an eye on you. All right. So now that's a knife, right? Put that back for now. So let me explain what we're doing today. What we're gonna be doing today is I'm going to be playing, or not playing, I'm going to be making character sheets for the Armist Boys. Uh, is anybody brand new to D&D? &D? Do I need to explain D&D? &D? Do you want me to go ahead and kind of explain what's going on with that? Or like, what are we feeling? I do like that green dice. It looks like a little, a little gummy. This is Adrian Von Ziegler. I already said that, but thank you. Uh, Tony, did I ever answer your question? Anyway, thank you for the soup. If I did not, I apologize. Oh, you said show me all your dice. That's right. I can't do that. That's right. I know D&D like the back of my hand. Yes, please explain. Okay, let me explain shortly. So the way D&D &D works is 
basically, over here, I've got a couple books. Um, you can see this one is the Dungeons Master Dungeon Master's Guide. What that does is it informs uh, here. Let me start over. Hold on. I got a better way to explain this. Let me turn my music down a bit. It's getting a little bumping. All right, let me explain this in a more concise way. D&D &D essentially is one person, in this case, that would be me, would be the dungeon master or the game master, depending on what you want to call them. And they are the equivalent of the system that you run the game on, right? So if you're, if you're playing, like, let's use World of Warcraft as an example. If you are playing World of Warcraft, I am the game. I am every NPC in the game. I am the, the gods of the game. I am the last rules lawyer who tells you whether or not something succeeds. And that might sound weird, but that's not much different than playing an actual video game, right? Because that is just D&D, &D, but the people telling you what to do are in the past. They've already set the rules of what happens, what the consequences are, and um, like how that is affected by your decisions, except it's much more limited. Where with a live person like me, I can roll with the punches and anything's possible. You know, like in Baldur's Gate, have you ever wished like, oh, but why can't I like, you know, shove my lock pick under the door to bar the way because it wouldn't be able to like scoot open that way. Like if you were playing D&D, &D, you could say that and then I would be like, okay, I'll set a check for that. And then I make you roll dice to determine whether or not it's successful. Does that make sense? Here's to the Gap Moe Holostar, where? Where is he? Where is he to press dead beat? Thank you for the soup. So an easy example of this, right, is let's say you want to play D&D. &D. And I've had people ask me how this works before. And they're like, but I don't understand. Like, how do you make, like, the rules? Most of the time, it's on the fly. So an example of that would be, let's say that you want to, uh, it's this, uh let's say you want to, um... You want to pickpocket a troll, right? You see that a troll's got, like, some some shit on it. Like, like a little bag hanging from its little scraggly leather belt. Just kind of dangling in the wind. It's making a clinking sound. Do you think there might be something valuable in there? Maybe a key to get out of its, uh, get out of its cave. Or maybe there's jewelry. Or uh, the bones of fallen victims. Blah, 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 blah. Right? So I say, okay, roll me a dice. And then what you do is you roll a dice. And in my head, as the dungeon master or the DM or whatever you want to call it, the GM, Right? I have set a goal that you have to beat. Now, you only rolled a four here, which might be a little hard to see in that light. Let me turn it a bit. You rolled a four. You probably did not beat that goal. Sometimes I tell you what it is. Sometimes I leave it a mystery, right? Sometimes I'll be like, that's going to be pretty hard. Beat a 15. Sometimes I'm going to say, uh, that doesn't seem very feasible, but you can try. And I'll set something in my brain, right? So essentially, the game master or the dungeon master is just the computer that processes what is happening in the game. Does that make sense? Do you understand now? So it's basically anything you want it to be. You could do anything in D&D. The game master is just the program that runs the game. They're also simultaneously the role player, um, the person who is the actor for every other character in the play, uh, and the story writer, and uh, a lot of other things. Being dungeon master is kind of hard, but it's a lot of fun. I recommend it. Cool? Got it. You do not see that 3.5 player's handbook. Silence. It doesn't exist. Okay, it is there, but that's just a little Easter egg. <laughs> where do you find friends to play D&D with? At work. That's where I found them. <laughs> I asked coworkers if they wanted to play. That was it. Uh, there's no such thing as 3.5, only 5. That's not true. That's not true. Uh, let's see. I'm late. I'm late. You're not that late. You're right on time. I just explained what D&D &D was. Can I work there? At the time, I was working as a herald of the Celestial Stag, which is to say I was a barista. So, like, yeah, I guess you could. Sure. Um, I have not played. Okay, I'm going to get this out of the way early before questions come in about what RPG systems I have played. I have played 5e, 4e, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, very, very, very minimal Pathfinder 1, in a very small amount of second edition with my older sister and her friend when I was like a little baby. So that is all I've had. I have read the books and the player's handbooks and the DM's guide for a couple different systems, but I haven't had a chance to like run them or play them. So there you go. That's okay, Elfie. I'll explain it as we go. So you might be a little confused about this little sheet here, and I'm going to explain that as we get moving. 
uh, ignore what I have on the sheet right now. I was just testing my text and what I could do, what I couldn't do. Um, I've played a very minuscule amount of Pathfinder First Edition. I've never touched 3.5, no. Uh, I have read the manual. That's about it. I don't know what that means. It's just different editions of D&D as well as a couple other tabletop games is what that means. So Pathfinder is an offshoot of D&D where Dungeons and Dragons is its own thing, right? Right. Cool. I am not using Roll20 for character sheets. I want to go through it uh, one at a time and show you that it's really easy to do just on the PC using a PDF or using Clip Studio Paint or using a pen and paper. It's super easy to fill out these sheets. The way you work these sheets is it depends on what you're doing, right? So the first thing you're going to want to do is you pick your character's name their their species and or race and their class right we're gonna be starting at level three because that's where the game gets uh pretty fleshed out personally i like starting at level one but just for the sake of argument i'm gonna start us at level three and uh do i make my own maps yes uh well it depends it depends sometimes yes not all the time mm -mm -mm. true D, D beyond and roll 20 are both good good assets Name's the hardest part every time, if you say so, if you say so. Uh, my favorite class to play is probably Rogue, but I've only been a player like four times in D&D, so I don't have a lot of experience with that. I've run many more games than I've played. Uh, I've played a Druid for two sessions. I played a Rogue for three sessions. I played a Wizard for one session, and I played a Fighter for about five. No point by. Be a man. Uh, I agree with you, C. Joe, but uh, it depends. Thank you for the delicious soup. D and D day. Let's go. Yep. I don't mind being a DM. I actually prefer it to playing. I get bored being a player. I feel like I have like endless clash changing syndrome where I want to keep swapping my character. I just I don't find much joy being a player. I'm not gonna lie. What we are doing, Shiro, is we're going to make character sheets for all of the Armist boys. I'm going to start with somebody simple. So one easy to translate person would probably be Octavio, myself, or Gold Bullet. Gerard's going to be a little tough, but I think I have an idea for it. Let's probably start with Gold Bullet. I think Gold Bullet's going to translate in a one-to-one, -one, right? Right. Okay. Good question, DT. Uh, not necessarily. Um, I used I, I I watched all or listened to all of the Adventure Zone for the first season, and I listened to about half of season two of Critical Role, but I kind of fell off. Um, I also really like watching Matthew Colville, Dungeon Master. I think he's probably the best Dungeon Master out there. If you want to get into being a DM, watch Matthew Colville's videos. He makes it super simple to understand and super fun. Uh, he makes it sound fun, and he's right because it is fun. Let me get my other glove on real quick before I do this. And we're going to turn around and I'm going to I'm going to show you some of this book, right? 5e Artificer is pretty cool. Well, we're keeping it a player's handbook for today. But Artificer is pretty cool and would fit uh, GB pretty well. I would argue that GB would either be a fighter or a ranger if you're going standard. If you're going with uh, guns in your setting, which personally I never would. Uh, artificer, but I typically don't allow artificers if I'm not, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> I'm an artificer anti. Ah, I'll explain in a moment what the difference is. I do feel like I would really, really, really like Brendan Lee Mulligan as well. I want to watch some of his stuff. I feel like he's got to be a really good DM, right? Artificers require that you change your entire setting and all of the technology in it, and I find that frustrating. I just don't like Magitech settings. I don't like magic tech. I just like magic and fantasy. Uh, but it can work at times. Some settings really work great with that. Final Fantasy is a really good example. For most of Final Fantasy, you have Magitech in some way. Uh, and that's fun, but I'm more of like a classic uh, either, um, you know, Lord of the Rings or like, uh, what's another low magic setting? Something like uh, Dark Souls, that kind of stuff. That's more my jam. 
Sometimes high fantasy, sometimes low fantasy. Very rarely magic fantasy. All right, let's get started, shall we, gamers? For those of you who are confused, I'm gonna spin around a bit and I'm gonna I'm gonna open this. So this is where you would start as a player, right? I'm gonna hold on. Is there a way I can make this so that it doesn't freak out that I'm turning away? Gassy, ghastly. Welcome into being a Rosader. Hold on. There's no real way to do that. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to move you guys over here so I can read easier. There we go. All right, so if you wanted to make yourself a character, where would you start? Well, first of all, you would ask your DM, hey, what's your setting like? What's allowed? What's not allowed? Because uh, some DMs are going to have a lot of arguments. Um about like what is okay and what isn't okay. Uh, some, so for example, if you were asking me, can I be an artificer? I would say you'd have to give me a really good reason. I tend to be pretty flexible as a DM. I'll find a way to make it fit. But a lot of DMs might just outright be like, no. Or you might even be playing in a campaign with no magic and they'd be like, no wizards, no, no sorcerers, no warlocks. You play a fighter, a ranger, or a rogue, etc. That would be pretty boring, but you could do it. Right? So anyway, you ask your DM, hey, what uh, can I play this character? Um, and then you figure out what you want to play by opening up this little player's handbook here. Uh-oh, hold on. Can I? Uh-oh, nope, that's the wrong way. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not going to lie, my, set my setup here, pretty fucking weird. But uh, you would open this, which is your player's handbook. And you're going to, I'm leaning away. Fuck, I'm leaning away. Shit. Um, and in there, you're going to turn to a page that shows you, um, uh, thank you for the delicious gifted memberships you're gonna turn to the page that gives you your races and your classes so for example in the basic handbook you've got a couple different things you can choose between you can be <clears throat> one second okay you've got dwarves elves gnomes tieflings Halflings, humans, uh, dragonborn, and I think that's it. And then you've got different variants on those, right? So you got like, uh, if you're a gnome, you probably get a plus to intelligence because they're very smart. But what if you're, what if you want to be a different variety of gnome, right? So you can pick something like deep gnome, which are like these uh, little little gnomes that live deep underground and they're very good at uh, mechanical work specifically, but they're kind of uh, lacking in. Um, emotional connection does that make sense cool easy peasy so you pick your race then you pick your class and then that is going to determine a few of your minor stats but mostly it's going to be about your class right like race will determine some very basic stuff about you and will help inform your role play if you're into role playing um but it can just be aesthetic if that's how you want to play that's okay right right halfling and half orc as well true true all right, let's open something here. Let's see. I'll open you to the tiefling page and explain what I mean by that. So tieflings are an easy one because everybody loves a tiefling. Oh, half orcs and half elves are also in this. That's true. Tieflings are your little uh, demon people. You've probably seen the blue one from Critical Role of Critical Role fame. Yeah, uh, Jester. But they are people that have somewhere in their lineage uh, demon blood in them. So they're very, uh, very popular, especially with the new era of D&D &D players as your original character do not steal. Tieflings naturally come with a couple things. One, they get a bonus to their intelligence, which is pretty cool. They're, they tend to be pretty smart. And they get a big bonus to their charisma. They're charming like most demons. They're good at making deals. They're good at talking. Uh, however, this is counteracted by tieflings having demon blood, which depending on your setting is very bad and they will probably be viewed with some level of prejudice depending on what your setting is etc 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 obviously it's all up to your dm they might have a completely homogenized setting where everybody gets along and everything's fine and there's not like this big aggressive like hatred uh between people or they might have a setting where you know religion's very important and demons are viewed very poorly um so you know your race depending on how much your table and your players and your dm give a shit about role play could be pretty important besides just stats. It also, you know, your race also dictates 
how far you can move because like shorter races can't run as fast as taller races because they have longer strides. It dictates like your carry weight or your, your body weight. Sometimes some things like tieflings and dwarfs had the ability to see in the dark and elves. So they get dark vision uh, and other special things like tieflings resist fire naturally and can use some hellish magic just passively, etc., etc. Cool? Cool. Altera's 20 feet of movement. Is Altera halfling? Because then yes. There is a fairy supplement, uh, technically Pegasus Pastel, but it is not in the main player handbook. You'd have to hunt that down. Hey, thank you, Poulette, for the delicious soup and the congratulations on 50k. Hell yeah! I'm here to bring D&D, &D, don't you worry. Now, I'm getting a little lost in the sauce here. I'm digging a little too deep. I don't mean to make this super confusing for you. Really, it's as simple as pick your race, pick your class. Don't think too hard about it, especially for your first character. Just go with what looks cool, right? So, like, if you're like, hey, I want to be, like, a guy with cool horns and red skin, and I want to I wanna be sneaky, you'd probably play a tiefling rogue. If you want to be like, I like... I'm a scaly, okay? Play a dragonborn. And then you're like, I love magic. Bam, dragonborn wizard or dragonborn sorcerer. Bam, done. It's that easy, right? Right. Just pick something that sounds fun and looks cool and you're in. Easy as that. You're welcome. I'm a nerd. Play an elf. Exactly. If you're a nerd, if you, if you grew up loving Legolas, you're probably going to play an elf. Um, my dark urge feels personally attacked right now, as they should. As they should. Listen, there's nothing wrong with being a scaly. Have a blast. I don't care. Uh, thank you, Pridoli, for the five gifted member chips. Um, nom, 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 nom. So anyway. Now you've picked your race, right? We've picked our race. What are you guys? What are you guys? What do you think you are? What race are we playing today? Elves? Dwarves? Halflings? Gnomes? Ha half elves? Half orcs? Tieflings? I ain't here to kink shame. That's true. Dearly beloved, welcome into being Rosader. We got a couple elves. We got a couple half elves. We got humans. Humans are great. I love playing humans. Drow, dragonborn, kobold. Okay, you're getting a little wild now. Genasi. I don't know about that. Maybe? Maybe. Rock and stone, baby. Okay, we got a lot of stuff going on. Let's pretend that we're an elf for now. It seems like we got a lot of elves. In Wait, nope. Ha Ooh, well. Ladger. Wow. Damn, that's a lot. I lied. No, not Kinku. That's Haka's thing. You know what? Fuck it. We're going to say that we are a... What did nobody say? Nobody really said gnome. All right, so we're a gnome now. The goth elves. All right, we're not getting into all the varieties of elves. That's too much. We'll go too far. We'll get too deep. All right, so we're a gnome. We're a gnome. Gnomes get a plus to intelligence, and I believe they get a plus to their wisdom, I want to say, depending on which sub-variety of gnome you are. If you're like a, a rock gnome or a deep gnome, I think there's hill gnomes, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, let's say that we're, we're a rock gnome. Cool? Cool. Yeah, we're Little Timmy. Our character's name is Little Timmy, and we're a gnome. Now we have a choice of class to play, and this is pretty self-explanatory. If you've ever played an RPG, you know what these are. I don't have to explain these to you, but real quick, I'll give you a rundown. You've got barbarians. They're tough to kill. They hit things hard. They like to get pissed off. That's about it. Okay, bards. They're bards. They play music. They're good with uh, lore and knowing many things. They're kind of the jack of all trades class. Hey, thank you for the delicious membership and welcome in moon spots. Uh, bards are your theater kid class. So if you're a theater kid, you're probably going to play a bard. If you couldn't decide on your class, you're probably going to play a barbarian. Uh, cleric is your religious, uh, for, for people who have, uh, Catholic trauma, uh, cleric is your super religious class. It's actually one of the most, uh, high variety classes in the game. At level one, they get to pick their deity, which changes the way they play pretty exponentially. Um, clerics are pretty cool. I've never played one because I struggle with the, um, hyper religious role play, but it's kind of fun, kind of interesting. Uh, Druid is your cleric, but instead of, like, you know, bowing down and kissing, you know, um, d and Jesus' feet, you kiss trees. Cool? Druids are tree huggers. It's that easy. Uh, for anybody who read Warrior Cats growing up, you're probably a druid. You probably want to turn into a big panther. They turn into animals, they summon animals, they, uh, they make out with plants. Druids are great, I guess. Um... I'll explain more about druids a little later. Fantasy hippies. There you go. Fighters. They are your uh, fighters. Yeah. F 
Fighters are it, it, what they say on the 10. They like to fight. They can be just about anything as long as it's not magic. Fighters can be like super sneaky and wear light armor. They can fight from a huge range and be really good with a bow. They can use crossbows, uh, any weapon in the game. They can be big two-handed weapon fighters. They could be uh, dual wielding, like super agile fighters. They could be like big armor, light armor, uh, no armor. They are really good with just about any physical gear. They're very easy to play, very fun. Technically, you can be a subclass of fighter that uses magic, but I'm talking about base level classes here. Suzuri, thank you. Baldur's Gate 3 taught me that people make out with bears. They do do that too. You're right, Samuel. Thank you for the delicious soup. All right, cool. We're past fighter. Monks. Um, if you never got past the, what is it, wuxia genre? Like the, the super uh, floaty, like uh, I jump 50 feet in the air and do a whirlwind kick. That is... That's a that's a monk. Wu Zing, sorry. Zhan Jia. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, it's martial arts movies. Cool. Like they do like the whole I can run in the air a little bit and uh like super martial arts movie attacks. Does that make sense? Oh, so I was right the first time I said it. Okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. No, we're not going to ban monks. Monks are fine. They're a little underpowered in the regular D&D uh, handbook, but they're still fun. They're interesting. Um, the only issue I have with monks is that they are so intrinsically tied to a culture that it can make it hard to blend them into multiple cultures, and that could be a problem the same way like clerics can sometimes be a problem blending in, but you can kind of make it work out. You can figure it out. Yeah, they have kind of a vaguely Shaolin vibe to them, uh, but anyway, that's okay. After Monk, you got Paladin. Their fighters and clerics uh, had a baby. So, like, if you have Catholic guilt, but you also join the military, um, you're probably a Paladin, right? So, like, they're uh, fighters, but they smite you with the power of God. They're the guys who run around screaming Deus Volt all day. Um, yeah, that's it. They're, they're, they're clerics, but instead of healing a lot, they like to hit a lot. That's about it. They are, in fact, Crusaders, but not Rusaders, technically. Uh, Paladins are largely considered one of the most boring classes or unfun classes to have in your party because most people play Paladins. Uh, they've got a really bad stigma for being, like, sticklers for morality and making it unfun to play with them in your party. But if you roleplay a Paladin well, they can be really, really interesting and really fun party members to have. Uh, and they don't always have to be super goody-two-shoes. You can work around on them. Uh, it depends. But anyway, we're not going to talk about that right now. What else do we got? Rangers. They're, uh, they're non-committal warrior cats. They're the kids who didn't, like, want to get down on all fours and play warrior cats, but they did watch the druid kids who did get down on all fours and play warrior cats from a distance and think, damn, I wish I had the balls to do that. Uh, rangers are good with bows. They usually have animal pets. Uh, they do just a little bit of magic. Uh, they could sometimes be good in melee, but not really. They're kind of trying to do too many things at once. They're, uh, they are simultaneously like Aragorn and the pet class and uh, magic users and fighters and range fighters and n environmentalists and survivalists. And it all doesn't really blend together super well, but they tried their best. Um, I think they're really, really, really flavorful, but poorly balanced, at least in the base handbook. They fixed it later. Shout out to all the... Whoa, hold on. Wait a minute there. Thank you for the delicious soup, Foster. Goblin Barbarian's a ton of fun. Being a three-foot-tall ball of rage going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a dragon is peak entertainment. Thank you, Rhea Gracewood, for the congrats on the 50k and the delicious soup. Ooh, thank you, Diana, for the five... Uh, whoa, hold on. For the five gifted memberships. I almost said Krim Zupas. Wild. Um... What else was I going to say? Oh, rogues. Uh, rogues are for everybody whose backstory is... Uh, my parents were killed by bandits. I'm my name's Ebony Ravenway Darkness Dementia. Uh, I've got a darkness inside of me. There's two wolves, and both of them shop at Hot Topic. Uh, so that's rogues. If you're that, then you're a rogue. Okay, cool. They're the sneaky class. That's about it. Um, next is sorcerer. Sorcerers are wizards who didn't want to go to college. Sorcerers are your weird uncle who for some reason figured out a few magic tricks with cards and seems to be immune to bad luck, but doesn't actually know what the fuck he's talking about. Uh, sorcerers are the trust fund babies of magic, where, where wizards are all like very learned and like gained their skills through study 
and careful like practice of magic sorcerers were just gifted with magic at birth and instead of using intelligence use raw charisma to wield their magic basically they're the rich boys of the magical world that's true or orandogo good point orandago doggo you know what you understand what i'm saying thank you for the soup yeah my dad works at the magic store and he says i'm allowed to do magic D&D &D does give them bloodlines, actually. You can do a draconic bloodline or a demon bloodline. I believe there's a fey bloodline. Uh, and then later they added more and uh, extra expansions like shadow bloodline, stuff like that. Uh, yes, I do think Gerard would be a sorcerer. Spoiler alert. That's probably what we're going to do for Gerard. But we'll see. Um, next is Warlock. If sorcerers were born into magic, Warlocks are the seedy, like, back alley people who did a quick drug deal for magic, right? Like, they, they go to their, uh, they go to their magic dealer, show up, throw them a quick 50, you know, and say, hey, can I buy a little bit of magic spells? And whoever's dealing them the magic says, yup, sure, here you go, bud. They just drop them a little gram. They're like, here's a gram of magic. Don't, don't spit it all in one place. All right? You come back. Remember, who's your sugar daddy for magic, all right? And that's it. Uh, that's how warlocks work. They weren't born into it, but they do make deals into it, right? So, like, if a sorcerer is born using magic, a warlock usually finds a demon or a dragon or, or a god or something significantly powerful and says, Hey, I'll sell my soul to you or whatever. I'll give you my firstborn, but you give me magic. And they say, okay. And then warlocks are locked in with that entity for until their deal is done. That makes sense? Great. Last is wizards. Wizards are what they say on the hat. They are... They're fucking wizards, dude. They, they study magic, they use magic. They're, they're, they're the classic old dude who's been in a college for 50 years and uh, never touched grass once in their life, but they know how to summon grass. Shadow Wizard Money Gang. We love casting spells. Do, 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 do. Okay, so now we know all the classes, right? So we are a rock gnome. And let's say for the sake of argument, we're going to be a fighter. And I'll explain how that goes a little later. You know what? No, we're done with that. I'm not explaining anything else. We're going to get right into making character sheets. We've been doing this for half an hour already. And I just explained the basics of how to start making a character. Now we're going to make a character, okay? Are you bearing with me? Are we rocking? Who do you want to start with? Do you want to start with, uh, I already said Barge. Do you want to start with Gold Bullet or Octavio? Who are we feeling? Let me do a poll, actually. Go. Vote. Start. Begin. Activate. I've summoned the poll! Begin voting! Okay, looks like actually it's a pretty close race with 60% currently on Goldie. That must mean we've got a 40% over there on Doc Ock. Uh, thank you for the delicious uh, soup. Warlocks are the epitome of the kid who fell for the old, Hey kid, you want to learn how to disintegrate someone? Trick. Exactly. 100%. Do I have a favorite racing class? Favorite class is probably rogue or fighter, and my favorite race is probably human or half-elf. Always open doors with fireballs. All right, let's see. That's 800 votes. That's more than enough, and it looks like Goldie wins on that one. So I'm just going to go ahead and end that poll. Boom. So with roughly 40% to Octavio and roughly 60% to Goldie, we're going to start with Goldie. If you can't play a boring race in an interesting way, then you're boring, and I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> I am not a half-elf. How dare you? I'm a totally normal, average human with a totally normal, average human lifespan. All right, so we're going to start with Goldie. Um, how do I do this in a way that makes sense? Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. So I'm not the one playing this. That's a lie. So that was a lie. Uh, gold bullet. Uh, we are going to skip backgrounds for now. We'll talk about that a little later. And we got to decide, is gold bullet going to be a fighter or is gold bullet going to be a ranger? Hey, cancel that. Don't do that. You know what? Just delete. Delete. Go away. Leave it on O. That's the O. You know... 
you're right. For the sake of argument, let's go ahead and say Gold Bullet is going to be a Ranger at level three. Ranger three. Done. Uh, obviously, Gold Bullet's character is not named Crimson Ruse. Uh, Gold Bullet's character is going to be named uh, Goldilocks. Uh, the Golden. Done. Goldilocks, the Golden. What race is Gold Bullet? Let me think. Your classic fantasy races for Gold Bullet. That's a little tough. Uh, Gold Bulletta. Oh, that's pretty good. Gold Bulletta. Oh, yeah. Now we're cooking. Very well done. Very well done. Very well done. I love that. I love that. I love that. All right. So let's see. Let me think. Gold Bullet. Gold Bullet. Gold Bullet's got long hair. Spends a lot of time out in the wild. Uh, just waiting around, you know, sniffing sand or whatever. Hmm. Maybe a wood elf, but a sand elf in this case? Could I say sand elf and make that, like, make sense? I guess so. Why elf? Because hair. Actually, I guess Gold Bullet's not, like, immortal or anything, though. Gold Bullet ages at a relatively average pace. Hmm. I could do Aerocrocra, which are like eagle people. A Gloomstalker Ranger. Well, the thing is, Raceley, I'm going with standard PHB to keep it simple for people. I'm trying to make this as approachable as possible to a brand new player. So I'm trying to keep this to standard uh, race class combos. Uh, we'll talk about um, expansions and stuff like that a little further along. Eric Croker's not in PHB, so you're right. I can't really do Eagle People, huh? Let's go ahead and say Gold Bullet would be... Gold Bullet would be... Hmm. What if? Okay, hold on. Bear with me. What if we work backwards? Right? Let's say we work from stats, and then we determine uh, what uh, race class combo that's going to end up based on stats. How do you feel about that? Thanks for the fun info on class of D&D &D characters. You made them interesting and hilarious, giving awesome examples of characters made sense. Hey, Thank you, Sassy, and thank you for the delicious soup. All right, so the way you do uh, stats in D&D &D varies. Most modern tables are going to do it this way. They're going to give you a certain pool of points, which I believe is 27, and they're going to say split those up how you like. Cool? Cool. So, wait, no, 27 is too low. What is the point? Hmm. I'm trying to remember what the base point is. Maybe it is 27. 32. 27 is correct. Oh, right. Okay, so it's 27, but all stats start at 10. Okay. So the way stats work in this game, this is going to be a little confusing. Bear with me for just a second, right? Bear with me for a moment. Look at me. We're going to do a little math. I know that's scary. I know math's scary, but just for a second, do some math with me. Every stat, technically... Starts at, what, 8? Is it 8? I thought it was 10. Maybe I'm wrong. It's been a moment since I've played. I played a cleric or two, albeit less hyper-religious, and I have a Celestial Warlock who's not for a campaign, and they're just sort of an OC. I tend to reflavor stuff a lot to make it work for stories I want to tell, as you should, Bunny Hugger. There's nothing wrong with that. Once you really get into the system, you can really reflavor a lot of stuff. Like, fighters quickly stop being fighters, like, the deeper you go in. You know what I mean? And rogues stop being rogues, and wizards can be whatever you want. Like, you can reflavor a very ice spell-centered wizard as a time mage. Shit like that. You can get wild with it. Uh, anyway, 27. Everything starts at 8. Um, well, thank you. Let me, real quick, I'm going to crack open a player's handbook and double-check one thing. I want to double-check one thing. I believe it's on, yeah, page 13. There you go, Flora. Thank you. You're right. It is 27. Okay, good. So I was right about that. I remember that correctly. And everything does start at 8. 
So, I'm gonna show you a table. Don't be afraid, it's just a little bit of math. It's gonna be okay. This little table here, up at the uh, top left corner. See that? That determines how stats work. It's not a big deal. All you really need to know is that for the all intents and purposes, most stats baseline is based off of your average relative, relatively healthy human, right? So if you were just a regular human, let's say human farmer, you probably have a 10 in everything, which means you get a plus zero and a minus zero to everything. Does that make sense? That's as basic as it gets. So like someone who is your average level of strength, which I mean by today's standards is probably a little lower, but by medieval standards, an averagely strong person, right? So how that affects the game. Let's say you see how they're on the character sheet over here, how it says strength at the top left. You see that? See how it says that? Let's pretend you have a 10 in strength. So that means you get a plus zero on every roll about strength. So if I wanted to push a boulder and my DM said, hey, uh, you could try to push that boulder, but you're going to have to roll me a D20. And I said, okay, I'll roll you a D20. Whatever I roll is that number. There is no plus, no minus. I just rolled a 14. That's how it is. But if I had a 12 in strength, suddenly I have a plus one to that. So every roll I do that has to do with strength is now higher by one. So that's a 15 now, right? If I had an 18 in strength, that's plus three. So now that's a 17. You can see how important stats start to get the further you go. So it seems completely random, right? When I first described D&D, you might be like, oh, well, it's all random. You don't get to influence at all. But that's not true. Based on how your character is built, what they're good at, and what their skills are, you get higher and higher stats, right? Sorry, 18's a plus four. You're right, because 20's plus five. Right? Yes, we're using 5e right now. So you understand the basis of D&D, right? You understand how it works. You didn't miss a lot, Aura. We're just now getting ready to start making Gold Bullet. Thank you for the delicious memberships, Ray. Yum! Memberships! Yes, kinda. No, you don't understand. It's okay. It's rel uh, Think of it this way. It's... The reality is it shouldn't be done this way. The whole plus minus system is a little silly. It's a little archaic. Uh, we should probably get rid of the like one through 20 stats and just make it so that you get your pluses or your minuses. But for now, we're going to rock with the system because that's what 5e is. Anytime you're at 10, you don't get any bonuses or negatives. If you go too lower or too higher, you get pluses, right? So 10 and 11 is plus nothing. That means that 12 and 13 is plus one. 14, 15 is plus two. Every time you stack up by two, you get a higher plus. That's not super hard. Super simple to remember. And if you need to, you can look up the table. And on that note, if you go further down, let's say you have an eight or a nine in a stat, right? Like maybe you're pretty weak. You get a negative. So where I rolled that 14 on pushing a boulder, suddenly that's a 13. If I'm very weak, maybe I have like a six or a seven. I get a negative two to pushing things. Pretty brutal. Pretty rough. Got it? Got it. So, point by works by assuming all of your stats start at 8, meaning you have a negative 1 in every stat. However, you get 27 points to spend on increasing those. So, like, if you were a ranger, for example, and you wanted to focus on fighting from a long distance, you would probably spend a lot of those 27 points in dexterity, right? Because you want to be able to aim well. You want to be able to land your hits. You want to be able to fight from a distance. Where if you were a fighter and you wanted to be up front and do a lot of damage, you'd probably spend a lot in strength and a little bit in constitution so you could take a few hits. I could see GB as a tabaxi cleric or a ranger. I could see that for sure, Tamsir. Thank you for the soup. True. Point by, you could technically only go up to 15. But... You get bonuses for your race, right? So, like, if GB was an elf, he'd get, like, a plus two to his dexterity. Does that make sense? Oh, I believe you. Role-playing negative stats is very fun. I definitely think that a lot of people underestimate how fun it can be to have faults. I think characters with negative traits are a ton of fun, right? Like, having a negative in your dexterity could make you a really clumsy, bumbling character that falls over a lot, and I think that's a lot of fun. So if you, like, let's say, for roleplay purposes, I'm like, oh, I want to jump the, the railing and uh, hit my opponent. I rolled a 7. 
Let's pretend I have a negative one to my dexterity. Oh, I rolled a six. Instead of just saying I failed and being bitter and grumpy about that, maybe I want to role play it. And I'm like, oh, I go to like leap over the railing. And uh, instead, I, I, my robe catches in front of me on my, on my shoe. I step onto it, stretch the cloth. I tumble hips overhead directly onto the ground and land on my ass. And my character grumbles or whatever. You know what I mean? Like you can make it fun and goofy instead of just being mad that you failed a roll. You know what I mean? Being perfect and having super high stats and everything, not very fun. Kind of boring. I mean, unless that's your way of having fun, which whatever. Go for it. Hey, yo, Mika. Or Micah. Negative two to wisdom raised by a cult. Yeah. So wisdom and intelligence are interesting because those can be role played in a lot of ways, either higher or lower. A negative wisdom can be role played as like lacking worldly knowledge, but it can also be role played as like raw naivete or like uh there's a lot of different ways you can go with it and that's pretty fun hey thank you for the delicious uh gifted member chips and thank you for the soup int seven bugbear cleric who thinks he's an orc due to his background that's super fun that's super fun so do the stats affect any role yes not there are some very rare roles that are raw, right? Like just a raw role. Like if you said, uh, for example, I would like to beseech like my God to help me. I might, if I was feeling generous as a DM or if it was narratively impactful and interesting, I might say, sure, roll for it. But I can't think of a stat that would go into that. Maybe religion, but really I wouldn't worry about it. I would probably say just roll. And I will tell you if you did it or not. In my head, I might say, okay, they have to beat an 18, no pluses, no minuses. That kind of thing, right? But there's no stat necessarily associated with that. No, I don't mean Cleric's Divine Intervention. I think Divine Intervention is a little silly. But I'll talk about that some other time. Right now, we're going to stick to the basics. I'm going to describe one other way to get your stats. Instead of doing point by, which I think is fun... I prefer rolling for stats. There's a very there's a very strict stat roll mechanic, which used to be the old school way of doing it, where you would just roll and what you got is what you got, right? So like, okay, bam, uh, suddenly Gold Bullet would have an eight in strength and you would just roll straight down. And that's brutal. That is a very, very, very hard way to play the game because you might end up with a really negative stat and something you really need, right? So like, oh no. I rolled a 12. I only have a 12 in dexterity, but that's my most important stat. Damn. That's brutal. That's that's tough. Um, but a softer way of doing rolling, and what I've seen, is the 4d6 method where you remove lesser, which is you roll four six-sided dice, and then you take the lowest stat and get rid of it. Right? Easy peasy. Not bad at all. So in the example of that, I would grab... A six-sided dice. A six-sided dice. Hold on. Hold on. Thanks, Meow Meow. And a six-sided dice. Cool. Okay, so we just roll all four. Easy as that. You find the one with the lowest number, which in this case is going to be this number one. And I take that out. So instead of having like just a raw eight in strength, GB would now have uh, a 13, which is actually pretty all right. That's not bad. That means he has a what? Plus one every strength roll. Plus one every physical melee damage hit he does. Pretty good. Pretty okay for a ranger, right? Am I a dice goblin? Not a, Not necessarily. But I do like dice, yes. Hey, thank you, Alias Listed, for the delicious soup. Am I going to reference the Bounty Hunter license to hunt stats or just go pure rolls? I will not be rolling for stats here because I think that while that is very cool, we are trying to build a true-to-the-character, you know, version. So I'm probably going to do point by here. But I wanted to show you the 4d6 take the lowest and get rid of it one because I really, really like it. That's the one I usually go with. Um, but I've always wanted to play in a campaign where everybody just rolls a d20 and takes what they get. I think that's a lot of fun. I mean, assuming you don't get a one. Because if you roll a one, I mean, that I think you die. Sorry, no. One's fine. It's a zero that you die in. So now you understand how stats work, right? You understand how you get your stats?
dying at character creation. How do you roll a zero? So the only way you could roll a zero is if you rolled a one and had a negative one due to a racial like stat distribution, right? Technically, some stats just shouldn't be allowed to be a certain level of low, like a one in intelligence. You just, you can't speak, right? Like, you can't talk at all, as far as I know. You're technically dumber than a, than in, in most animals. Like, most beasts, I think, have a three in intelligence. It would be funny. Now, as far as modern D&D goes, there is a very low chance you'll ever have a one in any stat because almost no table is ever going to do a raw roll system. They will do the 46, take the lowest, and get rid of it. And most DMs are generous enough to even let you put it where you want it right. So, like, if you roll 46 and you're like, oh, I rolled an 18, but you're playing, a, a, let's say, a wizard, they might just say, go ahead and put that in your intelligence. That's okay. You don't have to put that in strength. Personally, I would love to just put that in strength and be a buff wizard. That'd be funny as fuck. But, you know. Up to you. See you later, Kiko. I like rolling them in order, but most DMs will allow you to put it where you want. Muscle Wizard, I cast Fist! You're the wizard that studied at the gym, baby. War Mage, oh yeah. All right, so let's assume we're doing point by. We're going to assume all stats start at eight, and we have 27 points to work with. We're going to build out GB. I think GB's, we're going to start at highest and go lowest. I think GB's highest stat has to be dexterity, right? He is the sniper. No. Let me move my stuff around. Hold on. Where do you study? At the gym. Welcome, Untitled One. Hi! Dex and Riz? Does GB have Riz? Are you sure? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, that's not nice. So, the big box here that you see- Oh wait, my mouse isn't showing up. Why isn't my mouse showing up? Now is it? Nope, sure is it. Okay, I'm gonna show you by clicking then. The box you see at the top is for the raw number, right? So we're gonna say that's a 15. I'm gonna buy 15 points there. And then the box underneath that is where you put the modifier. Like the 15, for example, would be plus two in every roll. Does that make sense? We're going to keep it simple. And we are going to do the 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8 method. Unless I feel like there should be something else that's higher than that. I think personally, GB's next highest is probably going to be... Um, well, he is a CQC specialist as well. He does like close quarters combat. 15 goes in the small box? I disagree. I will never do that. How dare you? Silly Sphere. So, you have a stat. Let me explain real quick one more time. Real fast. I'm going to keep this super simple and skip out on everything else I've described. Your stat for any of these six is a number from zero to 20. And that number determines your plus or minus to every roll using that stat, right? So for example, if you have a 15 or if you have a uh, 14, a 14 or a 15, you get a plus two to that stat no matter what, right? Right. That's a high roll. Yeah, 15's high. 15's high. Especially if you get a racial bonus, right? So, like, let's say we made GB an elf. He'd get a plus two to dexterity, which would mean that GB is now at a 17. Just off the bat at level one or level three, whatever. Meaning that he gets a plus three to every single roll in dexterity, which is actually really good. That's great. That's awesome. You can technically sometimes finagle your way, depending on the dice system you use, up to, like, 18. Some DMs would let you do 20 at level one. Personally, I would never allow it, but, I mean, to each their own. I guess it depends on how you roll. If I do a raw roll, I mean, if you get it, you get it, right? I would say GB would have good wisdom. I agree. 
Well, I already talked about that pole of versatility. I like rolling. I think point by makes more sense for if you're trying to keep a balanced game and you have players who are not going to have the um, integrity to role play their character without a desire to win. I think a lot of people have a misconception that D&D is a game where you are playing against the dungeon master or the game master or whatever. But that is not the case. It is just a group storytelling exercise. Yes, it is a game. Yes, you want to win. Yes, you want satisfying narratives. But you can build satisfying narratives around characters that have bad stats. However, especially for new players, it could feel really bad if you do, like, let's say, dice roll, and you roll a bunch of fucking eights and tens, and somebody else at the table has, like, 18, 16, 15, 20, 18, and 10, right? Like, if somebody else is like, I'm better at everything than you are, that can feel really shitty. Uh, now, if you don't care and you're just like, I'm here to tell a story and I don't care if I air quotes win, that's fine. Uh, but not all players are going to be like that. Not all players prefer flavor to meta. Does that make sense? Siffy, if your DMs are trying to win, I recommend you stop playing with that DM. I recommend you move on to a new game. Because the DM will win. Does that make sense? You cannot play against the DM. The DM is God. If the DM's not trying to tell a story and not treating your party as integral to the plot, don't play with that DM. Because that DM could just say, a level 20 dragon flies down from the sky and lights you on fire, you die. That's really not fun. That is not playing with any level of integrity. Don't do that. Don't play with that DM. I had to go TPK. They were wiping the floor with level 20 dragons. Hey, sometimes it happens. Sometimes your players are really good or min-maxers or whatever. But at the end of the day, as a DM, you can literally just say, uh, God, the God, uh, a God snaps their fingers and you die. No save, no rules. You're dead. Uh, it'd be really shitty and you'd probably like lose a bunch of friends over that. But you could do it if you really wanted to. Uh, you don't want a competitive like energy between you and other players or you and DMs. That's just not fun. It is a delicate balance, exactly. I do like some level of stat optimization. I think there's this big, like, butting of heads right now in the, um... So in the D&D space, traditionally, D&D has been a stat-heavy game. D&D started out not as a role-playing game, but as a survival game. Right? Right? So the idea behind D&D was that you would make a character, roll their stats, no real influence over it, and they are expected to die. So you want to min-max as much as you can, cheese the game, try to like outsmart the DM. DMs were making dungeons that were essentially ha-ha, gotcha moments. Like there was infinite pitfalls that would instantly kill you. There was wall spikes that would just like slice through you and do like 30 D7 damage or some dumb shit. Like shit that doesn't exist, right? So players were encouraged to work around that and min-max as much as they could. Min-maxing is when you focus entirely on stats and making them as good as you can instead of focusing on the gameplay or the story or the character or how it tells, you know, a story, right? However, in modern d and I think it is more a balance between min-maxing stats and role play. I think most people want a narrative out of it. Now... That is not to say one way is objectively better than the others. I think there's this really bad, like, sour taste in people's mouth over stats players right now. I think that, unfortunately, a lot of people got into the game around Critical Role, and that's not a bad thing. But those players seem to think that they are inherently more important or better than players who want to have good stats and play for, like, you know mechanical balance and that's not bad there's a lot of games that are really cool that are built around making really strong characters and trying to like do numbers crunch and have really cool combat encounters that plays almost more like a video game in a lot of ways and there's a lot of settings that almost entirely ignore stats and don't give a shit and almost never roll dice and talk and role play their way through almost everything both are fine it really just depends on how you like to play ask your dm what their style is so you can gauge if you want to play at that table if you're a DM, explain to your players how you like to play so that they have an understanding of how you like to play instead of tricking them. Does that make sense? Like, you want to have what's called a session zero where you sit down and you say, this is the tone of this game.
So instead of like going straight into session one and just playing the game and somebody like at the table, you know, like fucking gold bullet comes to the table with a fully fleshed out cool character with 10 pages of backstory and like cool faults and flaws and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. If that happens, but you're playing a fully optimized game and you drop in like a level 12 dragon at level one and kill him. He's going to feel short-ended. He's going to feel like, oh, I never got to do any narrative like with this character at all. None of the shit I put into this mattered. And it sucks that he just died for no reason with no like actual relevance to him. Because you never had a session zero to sit down and say, hey, dude, this is how I like to play. On the other hand, if Gerard comes to the table and he's got his fucking like half-orc wizard uh, dick butt kiss. And all he does is throw fireballs at the party. But it's a super serious narrative campaign that's sort of like supposed to have a lot of political intrigue and all of these like big plot hooks around like different kingdoms fighting each other and he's just fucking fireballing the party and saying I try to kill the king over and over again that's not going to be fun for the other players either so you really want to set tone before you start uh before you start playing the game right right Gerard is a serious rp -er, though I think maybe I don't know I haven't asked but the point is, you want to make sure you set the uh, set the tone. What is the tone for this one? Um, the tone here is super basic, right? Okay, I believe in you, Octavia. I'm ready. I'm ready. The tone here is just making a character that sort of suits the um fantasy equivalent of the Armist Boys. There's no real tone. Also, hi, Octavio. Welcome in. You don't need to worry about tone here. We're not min-maxing. We're just doing a basic style. So I'm going to say that uh, GB has a 15 in dexterity. That means that I have now spent 9 of my 27 points. So I only have 18 points left to spend. So let's start spending, shall we? Um, I'm going to say... We're going to do the old 15, 14, 13, 12, 10 method. So we're going to put the 14 in, let's say, wisdom. Oh, no, I can't move it. Why can't I move it? Uh-oh. Could be worse. You could come to the table and counter a gnome and hold him hostage as your personal healer and hex rats. You could do that. That'd be real fucked up, though. But thank you for the soup. Taking these stats into Baldur's Gate 3. I okay, go make your go make the Armist boys in Baldur's Gate 3. You won't. There's not enough mods to make my hair in Baldur's Gate 3. I've tried. Oh, I hope so too, CJ. CJ? C Joe? Holy shit. CJ Crooks? Oh no. C Joe Crooks. I hope people do too, honestly. I, I think more people should play DD. I definitely think more people should be DMs and not be afraid of it. It's okay to fuck up. Nobody thinks you're gonna be Matthew Colville or Matthew Mercer right off the bat, right? Like that's okay. You don't have to be. Everybody's gonna like learn as they go. I started DM for a group of friends, and one of them managed to get a 21 AC as a paladin. I have a golden die specifically for him that more often than not rolls nat 20, so I let his high AC slide. That's fucked up, but I kind of love that, Sanders. <laughs> Thank you for the soup. Oh, no, it's not moving. Oh, shit. Move! There we go. Wait, you guys said to, actually, you said to move this into the Whittle Box. We'll put it in the Whittle Box. Oh, I fucked up. I can't grab it now. Ah! Uh-oh. I lied. We're going to keep it in the big box. Okay, so next we're going to do a 13 because we're doing the 15, 14, 13, 12. Again, we're not rolling dice on this one. We're just buying, if that makes sense, right? So I think his next highest stat's probably going to be strength so that he can fight in melee because he is a CQC specialist, right? Good night. Can't wait to watch the VOD tomorrow. Thanks for... Oh, well, thank you, Ray. And thank you for all of the delicious soup and member chips. I can't wait to mix them together to make some sort of weird, uh, grainy slushy. Nom, 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 nom. So 
So to ensure the GB could fight in melee, I'm going to give that 13 over there to strength, which might sound weird for a ranger, but bear with me. Rangers are can sometimes be jack-of-all-trade type characters, right? Uh, we're going to throw a 12 and constitute... Well, mm. let's go ahead and say we're going to do 12 in charisma because GB says they uh, uh, he has high riz, right? And then we'll throw the 11 in constitution... And so the lowest stat being intelligence, which isn't that low. It's okay. It's still a plus zero. It's not a minus. It doesn't mean that GB is stupid necessarily. It just means that GB doesn't have a bonus to intelligence, right? Right. Cool. Easy as that. So what this means, what you need to remember is that this means that GB has a two bonus to dexterity checks, right? A two bonus to wisdom checks, a one on strength, a one on charisma and plus zero to constitution intelligence. But this is before we picked a race. So let's pick a race, shall we? Hi, Rears. My friend wants me to play in a homebrew based on their novel, but I've never played D&D &D before. So this info is very useful. Thank you. Absolutely, Brick Wall. I hope it's helping. Uh, stick around for a second. After we're done picking race, I'm going to talk about proficiency, which is where things start to get a little more confusing. But I promise it's self-explanatory as you play, right? Uh, so I'm not using anything other than PHP. So we're sticking it to human, elf, half-elf, half-orc, dwarf, uh, gnome, halfling, tiefling, or dragonborn. Right? Right. I don't think GB really suits elf. Not quite. I would argue that GB would be... I'd be tempted to say human, or... Honestly, I could see a half-orc with really great hair. And a plus strength, which would mean make sense for the CQC side. Hmm... Thanks, Matilda! Honestly, I feel like half-orc, right? A half-orc who's a really good chef and has really great hair? Hmm. Very tall, too, because orcs are huge. All right, let's break GB down a bit, right? GB's got great hair. GB's very tall. GB's a CQC specialist and the sniper of Armis. GB's also our cook. Hmm. And sort of a uh, group mom, I guess. I could see elves are tall, orcs are tall. Could be a human, just a very tall human, I guess. Depends on your setting, Jumo K. So some settings, yes. Some settings have fantasy racism against elves or fantasy racism against dwarves. Most settings are going to have some level of conflict against some species or some race because... Unfortunately, especially in a medieval setting, um, even if you didn't have that, and let's say everybody was humans, they're still going to kill each other over anything because they're people are douchebags and sentient creatures like to kill each other for stuff. Uh, so if you're all the exact same people, you're going to kill each other over religion. Or if you're not killing each other over religion, you're going to kill each other over looks. If you're not killing each other over looks, you're going to kill each other over resources. If you're not killing each other over resources, you're going to kill each other over like belief systems. If you're not killing each other over that, you're going to kill each other over eye color. Something wild. It really doesn't matter. People just really like fighting people. Now, if you have a very homogenized society and they have a group enemy, maybe not. It really depends. You can do whatever you want with your setting. A lot of settings just completely homogenize their uh, fantasy species, and that's not wrong. That's not necessarily lazy writing. If you have a good reason why everybody's super working together or why everybody, like, accepts each other's differences and works together in sort of a utopian society and only really fights against, like, nature or monsters or magic or some malevolent evil entity, that totally makes sense. As Gerard should be. Delicious raw onions. Yum. I'm kidding. I would not eat raw onion necessarily. Well, maybe. I guess I have raw onions on my burgers. Hmm. Maybe not an onion by itself. Ooh, now caramelized onions go hard. 
Drow versus surface elves? Yeah, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Ooh, uh oh. I zoomed in. I did not mean to zoom in. There we go. Let's say that GB is, because we do have to make a decision here. GB is going to be. Hmm, I love red onions on my burgers. Hmm. Let me see what the stats are on half elves and half orcs. You better do it, Linen, right now. Halfling? I don't think halfling. GB's too tall for halfling, right? GB is a ranger. His stats are fine. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Hold on. I'm just taking a look at their stats. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. Half elves get... A bonus to charisma. Half orcs get a bonus to strength and constitution. Hmm. Hmm. Half orcs on average are well over six feet tall. Half elves on average are five to six feet tall. Hmm. That's a lot of half work. You know what? Sure, fuck it. Let's say half work. Okay. So we're gonna do half work. Hold on. A very handsome half work. Hell yeah. Alignment. I don't really worry about. So in D and D, I'm gonna really quickly explain this before we get back to what we we're doing. Um, so alignment is like uh, good. Neutral, evil, chaotic, neutral, or lawful, right? So it's a, it's think of it like a three by three grid and you could be anywhere on that grid, right? So you could be like lawful good or chaotic evil or chaotic good or lawful evil. It's really mostly irrelevant. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, alignment is kind of another archaic system from a time where fantasy was very much like, these are objectively good people, these are objectively evil people, and you can quantify that, and I think that's silly. Um, you cannot quantify good and evil. There are no good or evil people. There are only good and evil actions, right? Like, nobody is truly all the way evil forever. Nobody is truly all the way good forever. It is d depends on what you decide to do in the moment, right? If you treat it as reputation, that is very fun. That's true. If you're fa if you treat it as a fame mechanic, right? Like how the people see you. That's interesting. That's very fun. I like that. What about spells that affect alignment? Protection against evil. So that does matter, but usually only against monsters that are like good or evil. So like demons are always evil, devils are always evil, etc., etc., etc. However, I don't even like doing that. I find that if demons or devils are sentient enough to talk and make deals, then they are sentient enough to do good or bad things depending on what's going on. Mmm, they got changed, did they? That's interesting, Rizzy. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Don't mind me asking, as a DM, what kind of player do you have the most hard time with? I have had... Hmm. I think the most difficulty comes with players who are disruptive for the sake of being disruptive. I think players who just want to fuck with their party or fuck with the system or tug at the edges of the rules or see how close they can get to playing the game like it's Skyrim, right? 
Players who are like, I cast Minor Illusion behind the shopkeeper, and then I, I duck down so I'm stealth and I try to steal something off the thing. And then when you punish them as a DM, they get mad at you because they feel like you are punishing them, right? But I'm not punishing them. I'm establishing verisimilitude. So those types of players often love to be disruptive, but then when they suffer in-universe consequences, they feel like you are attacking them. So in this case, let's say it's a player who's like, I cast Minor Illusion and steal something off the table of the shop. And if the shopkeeper turns around and sees it happen, you know, they're going to be in trouble. What I mean by that, right? Uh, verisimilitude means... Uh, 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 sim Think of it like believability, like your ability to, 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 to insert yourself in the narrative and believe that it exists, right? So, in the case of like, let's say somebody stealing something from a shop, right? I would let the player do that, but one, I would warn them beforehand. I would break character and say, hey, especially if they're new, I would say as the DM, hey, just so you know, this could have really real very serious consequences that will permanently affect you. Are you sure you want to do that? Are you sure that is an action you want to take? I'm not kidding. This will essentially kill your character depending on how this goes, right? So you want to give fair warning. And then if they're still like, oh, yeah, you let them do it. And if they fail and the shopkeeper sees them and the shopkeeper tells the guards and the guards are like, okay, we're going to cut your hand off. Well, fuck it. I guess they get a minus four to dexterity checks from now on. Like, Sorry, but that's the reality. You can do dexterity checks. Boom. That sucks. That's brutal. That's rough. But that's the reality. But that player would feel like you punished them and attacked them, even though that's just how the setting works, right? You're like, dude, I warned you. I gave you your chance. I even let you roll, and you failed, and you suffered the consequences. Those are the most disruptive players because they believe they can take action with no consequence, and they get angry if there is consequence. Does that make sense? Do I always allow players to do what they want? Within reason, yeah. I mean, if a player says, hey, can I lift that building? I'll say, you can try. Give it a shot. Will I set an impossible goal? Yeah. Sometimes I'll say, yeah, you could try, but you're going to have to beat a 40, and I know they can only have like a 25 max. It's just how it is. But I'll let them try. Hey, what's up, Fleon and Maki Runes? Welcome in. How's it going, gamers? What are we up to? What'd you get done today? After I greet Fleon, I will explain what I mean by that and uh, the difference between letting people do what they want and breaking the game, right? Ooh, you had your OCs drawn. Okay. How'd that go? Was it fun? Wait, how many OCs did you have to draw? That's brutal. That's a lot of art. One of these days I should do an art stream. I don't have to practice. Welcome to Nerdville, dorks. All right, so a lot of DMs will tell you two sides of this, right? As far as letting players do whatever they want. No, no kobolds. We're sticking to PHB for now. I'm keeping this simple for new players, for people who are brand new to D&D, &D, right? Okay, so what somebody asked me a second ago was, do you let players do whatever they want? My answer is yes. However, some things are just impossible, right? So, if a player said, can I walk through that lava? What I would say to that player is, you will 100% die if you walk through that lava, but you could try. And what most players are going to ask me, especially new players, are, what if I roll a 20? I'm going to say, you can roll a 20, but a 20 just means the maximum of your capabilities, which still means you will die if you walk through that lava. Right? So if someone says, can I pick up that building? I could say, you could try. And then they roll a 20. They're like, wow, I did it. I rolled a 20. I win. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how 20 works. 20 is a crit. That is not a success. Yes, that is the highest you can do. Maybe I'll even like role play something cool for you. Maybe I'll be like, the building groans under the weight of you digging your fingers into the earth beneath it. Your party watches as you shovel your fingers through the hard packed dirt, ripping through rock and stone and the woodwork and the stone starts to creak as you lift up, but the building does not budge. You know what I mean? Like I'll give them their cool moment. It seems badass, but they're not gonna do it because it's just impossible. It can't happen. Some things just can't happen. 
And I'm okay with that. And players should be okay with that. You did hear Rock and Stone. Yes, I treat natural runs as critical failures. I find them funny. I like critical failures. I think they add a lot of randomness to the game. Rocket Stone, baby. Uh, trip on your sword's a little boring, but you can do a lot of fun stuff with uh, critical failures. I think rolling a one's just a ton of fun. So plausibility, it needs to make sense. Exactly. You're not Superman. You're not, you're not gonna, like, fucking break the laws of the game. Because if you let people roll for literally anything and you, te and you tell them a 20 is always a success, players will optimize fun out of any game no matter what, right? So if you say a 20 is always a success and you establish that early, eventually you're going to get your bards being like, okay, can I convince the king to give me uh, the kingdom? Can I, can I charm him and he'll just give me his crown and I'll be king? And if you've already established 20s are a yes, I promise you Lady Luck is going to give them a 20. They, it will happen just to fuck up your narrative. 100% of the time. No, a brick would not fall on your head, but you might sprain your hand. I might give you a negative one strength checks for the rest of the day if you rolled a one on lifting the building. I have never came across a player who uses loaded dice, no. But, but I rolled a 20 on destroying the universe. Exactly. You'll get those players. Yes, 20 is a success. Depends. That's exactly what I'm saying. It, it depends. It 100% depends. Now, you should try to give people rewards for rolling high, right? Like somebody earlier said, in the co context of lifting the building, no, you didn't lift the building, but you did wedge a couple bricks loose, and you realized that you could squeeze a smaller party member through that crack, right? It, a, a good DM will say, yes, you can try. No, it's not guaranteed. A great DM will say, you get a minor success and something cool happens. And a, a, a spectacular out-of-this-world DM will find a way to facilitate giving somebody else the spotlight and still making you seem cool so that everybody gets a chance to participate and have fun, right? So the big half-orc barbarian, like, tries to lift the building, fails, tears apart some bricks. An opening is made, but it's only big enough for the halfling rogue to get through, Right? And then maybe the ranger sends their pet cat in with the rogue to scout ahead. Bam. That DM has found a way to make sure everybody in the party is having fun and participating in their own way. Does that make sense? Everybody's had their moment. Everybody did something cool. How do I get Ruse as my DM? Good question. Uh, <laughs> join Hollow Armors. <laughs> I want to play Age of Worm now. Age of Wonders 4, you said. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that's a good... I agree. What? Uh, if they have 100% chance of failing or succeeding, don't have them roll. But a lot of players are just going to want to roll for the sake of rolling. It really depends on the mood of your table. Like I said, none of these are a hard, fast rule. It depends on what you want to do. Some DMs will 100% be like, no matter what, a 20 is a success. No matter what, a 1 is a failure. And that can be really fast and loose and goofy and fun. Um, really good for beer and chip style D&D &D, where you just gather up. You all get a little tipsy. You all drink. You all like munch fucking like bar food, order pizza, and you just kick back and make dick jokes or whatever it is you're doing and play your D&D &D game. Do I like that kind of D&D? Very, very rarely, not really, but I know a lot of people love just playing D&D like that, and there's nothing wrong with that. That can be really fun. You probably got gifted at Jackie's. We are still on Goldie, you're right. Actually, Smokey McPot, good point. I gotta make some uh, movement here. Alright, so Goldie is going to be a half-orc, which means Goldie's going to now get the half-orc uh, species benefits. So... That automatically gives a plus two to strength, meaning this is now a 15 and a plus one to constitution, which is actually pretty big because that takes Goldie off of the t t uh, 10 and 11, which is plus zero up to a 12, which is plus one. Meaning for now on, every time Goldie levels, levels up, that's an extra one HP, which could stack up pretty fast, pretty cool. Also, strength just went up to a plus two, which is really nice. So now Goldie is equally matched in ranged combat and melee combat, is a little tankier, still has great wisdom, and, I mean, 
has a little bit of Riz. You know, I got a plus one on the Riz checks down here. Not bad at all. Very fun. Very cool. Right? Right. Are these rolled stats? No, we're doing point by right now because I'm just trying to keep it vaguely lore accurate. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now we focus on things like proficiency bonuses. You don't need to worry about that too much. Uh, I believe that's a plus two at level three, so we're just going to say it's a two. I will explain what proficiency is in just a bit. It's a little confusing to talk about immediately. Ignore inspiration. And we're going to talk about what the bonuses are right here, okay? So these are his saving throws. Every class gets proficiency in saving throws, which I will talk about just a little later, okay? Let's start with a different thing. Proficiency is when you're a professor. You're right. Wait a minute. I got to check if half-orcs get any bonuses besides that. Oh, fuck. I do got to talk about proficiency. Damn it. All right. We're going to talk about proficiency. Damn it. So half orcs always start at 30 feet of movement speed. This is the equivalent of six spaces on the board. If you're playing on a grid, like a checker style board with a grid based system, six spaces. That's all you need to know. Most smaller races get 25 feet, so that's five spaces. Every five feet is one space. It sounds confusing. I promise it's not. Just divide it by five and you know what it is. It's that easy. Cool? Cool. Initiative isn't important yet. We'll get to that in a minute. Armor class is impossible to measure right now because we don't know what armor Goldie is wearing yet. We'll get to that in a minute. Don't worry about that yet. We'll do quick math in a second. It's a very cool set of dice, Lord Banger. Half Orc does get proficiency in intimidation. Right now, I'm trying to decide how I'm going to mark proficiency. I guess I could just use a... You know what? We'll do it... You know, we'll do it live! We'll do it this way. So, proficiency. What is that? Proficiency is plus two at this level. Meaning that Goldie gets a plus two to anything that, profi that uh, he is proficient in. Certain classes get proficiency in certain things, and certain races get proficiency in certain things. For example, half-orcs always have proficiency in intimidation. No matter what, that is the case. They just, they are good at intimidating people. They're kind of scary. So that's, check, we got that, right? Yeah, like their talent, or like what they have trained in, or what they have studied. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to flip over to the page where the ranger is real quick, and we're going to see what their starting proficiencies are. I will show you the ranger page in a moment. So, when you pick your race, it's going to give you a bunch of different, like, stats and abilities. You're going to mark those down, and then you're going to go over to your class once you pick that. And you're going to see a page kind of like this one. Ta-da! And it's going to give you lore descriptions, stuff like that. And it's also going to tell you what you are good at and what your starting gear is, right? Bless you! In this case, it looks like rangers always start with their hit points being 1d10 per ranger level. Sorry, their hit dice are 1d10 per ranger level, meaning their hit points at level 1 are going to be 10 plus their constitution modifier. Why is this important? Because we just got up to a 12 constitution modifier, meaning he gets a plus 1. So he'd start at 11 HP, starting out. He would have 11 as his maximum HP. However, 
every time GB levels up, he's going to roll a D10 and add plus one because he has a plus one to his constitution. Since we've already established we're starting at level three, that means I'm going to roll two D10 and add two plus ones, right? Keep up with me here. It's quick math. Here's our D10. It looks confusing. It's not. That's a five. Plus one is six. So if we start at 11, we add six. So that means that Goldie is at 17 HP at level two, right? One more roll. And another six. Easy peasy. So we're at 23 HP total. Not bad at all. That's okay. Now, if you don't want to roll for your HP, you can take the median number plus one, right? So if you wanted to, you could just take six at each level instead of rolling. I always roll for my HP because I think it's fun. But GB would technically have had higher maximum HP had GB not rolled and just taken the six at each level. But we're going to say GB rolled for this. Uh, I should type this, but I'm not going to. I'm going to use my little mouse and it's going to be ugly. 23! You know what? I am going to type that. I lied. I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. Yeah, you can have a house rule that you reroll, um, reroll ones. That's fine. Listen, it's your fucking oyster, dude. It's your D and D game. Do what you want. Okay, now that we got the maximum HP out of the way, let's keep it moving. This is this is uh, this is gonna go a lot faster for the next couple classes as we go. All right, all right. So GB has proficiency with light armor, medium armor, and shields. That are the that that is the type of armor that GB can wear. That means things like cloth armor, padded armor, leather armor, hide armor, chain mail. But GB cannot wear heavy armor, meaning no like plate mail and stuff like that. Right, right, cool. GB also has proficiency with simple weapons and martial weapons, which basically means every weapon in the game other than very specific racial specific weapons. Cool, cool. I do milestone leveling Musai because I just don't care to keep track of uh, experience and I find that D&D doesn't measure experience very well anyway. Rangers have no starting proficiency with tools. This only matters for some people, like rogues having starting proficiency with these tools, for example, right? Like lockpicks and trap disarming kits, that kind of stuff. Got it, got it. Next, and this is where it's important, you check what the proficiencies are for your skills and your saving throws. This is very big. This is going to affect your whole game. You'll see that here. See right above the character sheet. Saving throws, skills. So we know that rangers are always proficient in strength and dexterity, and they get to choose three from animal handling, athletics, insight, investigation, nature, perception, stealth, and survival. Right? Right. So... How does that work? First of all, we're going to put a little check on strength. Uh-oh. My check's not working. What did I do wrong? Ah, I see. I'm an idiot is what I did wrong. Okay. Strength. Dexterity. Very ugly. That's fine. We get a plus to that. Easy peasy. Now, why this is important, what he's proficient in, right? Right? Remember earlier when I said proficiency bonus up here, this thing, this plus two? That goes up the further you get into the game. So it's going to change the way these stats work, as well as these numbers over here on the left, right? So because he's got a plus two in strength and a plus two in dexterity, typically on a saving throw for strength or dexterity, you would add two to your roll. But because he's also proficient in those, you're now going to add four. Because it's two proficiency, two for the stat itself. I 
I really should have just done this by writing it myself, but we're here now, so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab it. I'm gonna grab it. I'm gonna grab it. I should have thought this through. I should have thought this fucking through. Grab it. 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 Why do you want so bad to rotate? I don't understand. Please. Ah! You know what? There we go. Easy as that. Yeah! <laughs> well, the form fillable version, the problem with that, uh, Vistler, is um, if I use the form fillable version, version, it tries to dox me, which is not great. I don't love that. So I'm not going to do that. Constitution, we've established that the bonus to Constitution that GB got for being a half-orc has actually moved it up to a plus one on Constitution saves, which is pretty good because... Constitution saves happen a lot. Anytime you're like poisoned or exhausted or things like that. So Constitution is going to come up often. We know that GB is not necessarily exceptionally intelligent, not dumb, but a plus zero to all intelligence saves. Oh, now we're moving. Now we're moving. We got a plus two on our, uh, wait, no. Is that plus one? Let me think. 10, 11, 0, 12, 13 is 1. 14, 15 is 2. Okay. Man, it really has been a while since I've played. Wild. And then we got a plus 1 on our charisma checks, lastly. So that's actually a really good lineup. Those are good pluses. Very few zeros. That's a very balanced character. Not exceptional at anything necessarily, but very balanced. Very cool. Very easy peasy. Very fun to play, I'm sure. How many dice sets do you have? Too many. Yeah, and saves can be brutal. Very brutal. So, good jack-of-all-trades character so far, right? Now, let's talk about these. This seems intimidating. This big, long list of skills, right? This seems a little scary, a little awkward, but it's not as bad as it sounds, I promise. All you need to know is that from that list I read you earlier, the Ranger list of skills, you get to pick three skills total. So those are Animal Handling, Athletics, Insight, Investigation, Nature, Perception, Stealth, and Survival. We should break down those by the ones we know are guaranteed, like Yes, GB is skilled in survival, clearly. Thank you for the five delicious gifted memberships, nothing. Thank you for helping with the math. Hey, Osaya. Now I've got two left. I definitely think GB is going to take stealth. That would make sense to me. Now we've got one left. We could do perception. We could do animal handling. We could do investigation, insight, athletics, maybe. I think perception is very good. One thing you'll learn is that perception is probably the most important check in D&D. Insight is your ability to... In its base form, insight is your ability to read a person. Understand, like, when they're lying, or if something's off, or they seem like they're nervous about something, or if, like... It, it, it's basically social perception. If perception is your ability to spot something amiss, or spot a trap, or see something moving in the distance, right? Insight is your ability to socially understand that something is off. Based custom background truther. I don't fuck with bath backgrounds most of the time, but I mean, it depends. Uh, I'm not going to explain backgrounds this time. All you really need to know is that your background is your character's history, and that determines more skills that they are skilled in, usually two plus a tool or a vehicle. Meaning, let's say your background is I was a cart driver. You probably know how to wield a wagon and like guide horses while they're, you know, driving a wagon. And you probably get animal handling, and you probably get, uh, let's say, 
let's say you reason out or lore out. Okay, I get animal handling and I get nature because I'm used to riding through long strips of like desolate wilderness with no society in between. Right? Right. Easy peasy. That's how backgrounds work. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just not going to bother with that right now. It's just good for fleshing out roleplay and giving you more skills to work off of. However, a lot of classes get a lot of skills already. I'm looking at you, bards and rogues. And adding a background onto that, woo, that's tough. That's a lot of skills. So, what do these check marks mean? Well, just like on these saves, anything that is checked... GB is proficient in, meaning GB adds a plus two on top of the already plus to the stats. I'm just going to write in a couple stats here. Two. Yeah, that mouse writing, very beautiful. Two. One. One. Two. Ooh, very nice. Zero. I'm going to do that for these two because I don't feel like typing all of it. What does nature do? So nature is knowledge of natural things, like understanding the habits of certain creatures in an area, being able to guess like whether something's herbivorous or carnivorous, um, trying to determine whether like why a tree is sick, things like that. Is this poisonous? Is this not? Can I eat that? Et cetera, et cetera. You do get bear lore for nature. That's true. I just realized I blocked my little uh, my little fridge. I cannot get to a drink. This sucks. Oh, well. I'll have to go, go elsewhere and get it in a bit. Is that a vampire tree? Good question. Is that a vampire tree? Make a nature check. Roll your nature check. I thought bear lore was history. No, 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 no. Bear lore is nature. Uh... Like, the lore of a city is history, right? D&D, but the DM is very vague about everything. Yup, yup, yup. Some of these checks are only useful depending on your style of play and your style of dungeon master, right? Like, a lot of times you'll play an entire D&D campaign and never once use survival. And never once use religion. It depends on your DM. A good DM will definitely find reasons for you to use those, but... It can be hard. Some of these are super simple. Like, you'll always use perception. Oh, uh, can I do a perception check to see if anybody's hiding nearby? Is there a trap? Is there uh, a secret, like, key hanging from a string behind the shelf? You're going to use perception all day, every day. Stealth all day, every day. Um, athletics and acrobatics. Here and there. Um, persuasion and de deception come up a lot. Uh, but some of the, like, intelligence and wisdom checks are pretty rare. Usually, you'll see a lot of, um, perception and the dexterity checks and the, uh, charisma checks. What is the difference between athletics and acrobatics? Great question. So, athletics is your physical, like skill and endurance essentially so like your ability to run for a very long time uh to jump very far to like push something over to pull something down to heave a heavy object that's influenced by strength acrobatics is your ability to like do dexterous physical things like tightrope walk or um do a front flip over a railing um uh skateboard down uh, on a shield while you're shooting orcs that kind of stuff that's the difference so, we know that uh, GB gets a plus two to any dex, and you can see that this says dex in parentheses here. So, two. Wisdom, GB gets a two to that. Two. Arcana, GB gets a zero, because that's intelligence, right? You understand, see this is pretty self-explanatory, pretty easy to get through. You just go down the list, doing what you got. One, zero, two, until you get to a train skill. Then you got to take the bonus for that skill. Intimidation is charisma, so one. But GB is trained in it or proficient in it. So you take this proficiency bonus, and that's a three. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Easy peasy.
all clicking together now, right? It's not as hard as it looks. It seems confusing. I promise it's not. Good point, George. That's definitely not a bad idea. Uh, George says, I lower some dice checks. DC stands for dice check, and it's usually what the number is the DM has in their head that you have to beat to do something, right? So, for example, George says, I would let a cleric have a lower dice check on something like religion, even if the player doesn't put a PB on it, right? So, if a cleric, which is inherently a religious class, makes a check on a religion that they are familiar with, or even sometimes other religions, because they're familiar with how religions work, the dungeon master might say, okay, so for you, you have to beat a 10, where if, like, the barbarian was doing it, maybe you'd have to beat a 15, right? Anyway, let's keep going down our list. Zero on intelligence, we got a two on wisdom, zero on intelligence. And we've got a four here, because it's two wisdom, and then we get the plus two for proficiency bonus. One for charisma, one for charisma, zero for intelligence. We've got a two on dexterity. Now we are trained in both of these. And we know we get a plus two in dexterity, and we get a plus two in wisdom. So that's a four total on both. Now, for those of you who might be a little bit confused on what these numbers mean, more often than not, you are going to be asked to make a roll based on these skills instead of a raw stat, right? So, like, if you say, I want to... We'll go back to the lifting the building example. If you say, I want to lift that building, instead of me saying, hey, make a strength check, I will probably say, make an athletics check. Now, sometimes, if you're not trained in it, that's the same thing. Plus two strength, plus two athletics. But if you want to scare the shit out of somebody, you're like, I want to I want to threaten the guard and tell him if he doesn't let me through, I'm going to kill him. I would say make an intimidation check. Why is that important? Because you get a plus three instead of your usual plus one on a charisma check. Right? Right. Where if you said, I would like to convince the guard that I belong here and I should be in this, in this castle because I'm actually a nobleman. I might say make a performance check or make a persuasion check, which is less effective than intimidation. Does that make sense? So you're a barbarian, yeah, Ruse? Hmm, maybe. We'll see when we get there. So you roll and then add the extra number to what you get. Exactly, exactly. So in this case... I'd be like, hey, make your performance check. And you'd be like, oh, or make your intimidation check. You'd say, okay. And then you roll a three. Not very good, but you get to add three to it. That's a little shiny over there. Let's move this over here. Oh, that's really shiny. Why is that so shiny? Oh, no. Did my light move? Okay, we're going to pretend you rolled a 15 because that side of the dice is somehow less shiny. So, 15. And then, boom, you add a plus three to it. That easy. 18, you probably intimidated them. Win in two hours? Don't test me, Chrysanthemum. I might do it in two hours. I might do it much quicker than that. We'll find out. You like my Necron dice? Thanks. They're not for Necrons, but I still like them. Don't worry about personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws. I feel like writing those down is a little silly unless those are really set in stone. Like, for example, you could put uh, arachnophobia here or like... It's hard to write some flaws, right? Like, untrustworthy is something that you, like, kind of role play. It's not something you just write down. Um, but you could put very specific flaws here, like afraid of water or uh, hates dwarves, whatever. Um, sure, you could do that. But honestly, I wouldn't worry too much about this side of things. This is kind of like... Uh, this is more like if you were writing it for somebody who wasn't in the campaign with you. I feel like most people are just going to know this about your character. You don't really need this. It's kind of a cheat sheet for the DM, I guess, etc. Can flaws affect your roles? If it was a bad enough flaw and it was part of your character and you wanted to role play that, sure. Like if you were like, I'm afraid of water. And I, and I was like, oh, you need to cross this river. Make an athletics check. If I know you're afraid of water as the DM... And you tell me that, and you're okay with me using that against you sometimes for narrative purposes, and you want to overcome that, or like have that be part of your character and your story, uh, yeah, I'd probably be like, yeah, do it, but you get disadvantage. You have to roll 2d20 and take the lowest one.
Listen, if you want to write your 27 like page essay on your character's personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws, that's fine. I don't think a new player is going to need to do that or want to do that. And also, I think it's going to take a pretty good role player to genuinely stick to these things, right? It depends on your your type of session, the type of campaign you're running. I find most people will leave these pretty blank, but it really just depends, right? Right. I think most people are gonna go the Watt direction where they write a backstory and flesh out the character as they go. So you could add to this, right? Like let's talk about being afraid of water again as a flaw. What if, somewhere in the campaign, you almost drown? You go underwater, a lizard man or like a slime drags you underwater, your character goes down to zero HP, your party barely saves you, right? Maybe your character now has adopted the flaw, afraid of water, because they almost drown at some point. That's scary, that's freaky. So now, when they're near water or they have to do something in water, maybe they get a natural negative to something like that. That's a lot of fun, you can write that down if you want to, but I feel like most people are just gonna know that. If they're in your game with you, right? That's Ruse's backstory. You caught me. Yeah, bonds can be interesting. I'm not going to go over these too much because it's a little too much for a first time talking about D&D, like getting it started. The the more you play D&D, the more you're going to be able to flesh these things out, the more important they're going to be. Like if you do a I know a guy rule, bonds suddenly becomes really important. Uh, ideals can be important, but in a lot of ways, that's kind of like that shifts with your character, right? Like, sometimes your ideals are really important. For a paladin, they might have a very stringent, like, I do not believe in uh, hurting a defenseless enemy ideal or something. But even then, that's often only there so that it could, like, create interesting narrative with your character and conflict. And the DM should probably just know that. You don't have a wizard Hakito yet, Haka. Also, hi, Haka Senpai. How's it going? Not necessarily, Kinga. I think a good DM will always make use of your backgrounds. If you write a lot of back, the more backgrounds you write, the more the DM has to work with, right? So they can bring important characters from your family or your history or friendships into the game and use that against you or for you. And that's fun. And that helps like ground your character in the reality of the world. And it helps like create this sort of like bond that the player then has and it makes the player feel valued right it makes the players feel like the dm gives a shit about what they wrote and you're working collaboratively instead of like the dm being like you're just characters in my book does that make sense exactly i hated the way that my dm used my background your dm should probably ask you uh but i guess it depends on the dm shrug who was that? That was a uh, DM, DM Roos. That's actually, that's how I talk when I DM all the time. That's my DM character voice. So whenever I run a DD and d campaign, it's going to be like this the whole time. You find yourself in a tavern. Oh my god, bro, you sound like a nerd. Hey, I don't know how to tell you this, Mardak, but uh, we're sitting here for two hours making a character sheet for Dungeons & Dragons 5e and you're watching an anime boy on the internet. I think we're all nerds. <laughs> it's okay, we're all nerds here. You should leave holes in your background. It's a lot of fun. What a nerd! Unlike me, <laughs> jock. <laughs> I wear my baseball cap backwards and push nerds in lockers. Or whatever the, 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 the jock thing is, right? That's what jocks do, am I right? <laughs> I only play Barbarian. Robert the Punch was a great name. Great name. Well, if I'm a nerd and you're a nerd, who's flying the plane? Like, zoinks. All right, let's speed run this shit, shall we? Uh, I'm gonna cut through some of this character sheet. I'm also gonna, woo! I gotta get these gloves off, they're killing my hands, I'm dying. 
Will we fill out the half orc traits? Sure, we'll do that real quick in a second. You're not going to see my hands for just a second because my hands are dying. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Don't worry about most of this stuff. Attacks, spell casting. Uh, technically, rangers do get spells. I'm going to quickly run through that and we will move on to the next character sheet because I do want to move along. There's technically a lot more to talk about. Like, I could hide this, boop, and you would see this back sheet. Ignore the numbers on it which has your character's appearance, which you can either write down or draw. Allies, organizations, those are bonds within the narrative that you have to deal with, which is pretty cool. Uh, the symbol of your organization that you belong to. So in this case, it would be Armus. Um, the character's backstory, which you can write a quick bullet point down here. Additional features and traits. This is where you put your half-orc traits, right? So half-orcs have the ability Relentless Rage. If they get knocked down to one HP, they can basically not die for a second and get really pissed off and start fighting even harder. Very cool, very fun. Treasure is like all of your stuff in your bag, your loot, et cetera, et cetera. Cool? Cool. Understood. Let's say we hid all of that though, and this. Bam, one more page. This is only relevant to people who are casters. So if you're a wizard, it's going to have your spell cla casting class. We'll talk more about this when we get to Octavio, because Octavio is going to be a spellcaster. Okay, okay, cool. Not catnips, cantrips. I'll explain the difference between those in a minute because spellcasters are just slightly more complex than fully physical classes. Rangers are half casters, meaning that they do get spells. But they're, they don't get as many as full casters, like wizards and sorcerers, that kind of stuff. Cool? Cool. So, let's skip filling this out. We're not going to bother. Don't worry about experience points. I'm not going to bother with that right now. Hell yeah, Skylar. A Minecraft D&D &D campaign. That seems pretty interesting, actually. That sounds like a lot of fun. Writing up a stat sheet for Creeper would be so fun. All right. Passive Perception. This is typically, I want to say this is 10, typically, meaning a plus zero. Uh, and then you take your perception modifier and add it to it. So this would be a 14, I think. The only thing this means is that if somebody's not making a perception check right, um, the passive perception is how perceptive they are without having to look around. So if somebody, a monster, let's say a goblin, is trying to sneak up on GB, the goblin has to beat a 14 on a stealth check. So they'd have to roll a d20 and get higher than 14. Otherwise, GB sees them even if they're not, like, even if GB's not looking for them. Doesn't even have to be trying. It's just there. It just is. Got it? Got it. D&D Online depends on how you play it, but yeah, it could be good. Uh, other proficiencies and languages. You're probably not going to fuck with this too much depending on your setting. In my setting, I would definitely love to mess with this. I would probably set up languages based on like region, uh, sometimes religion, uh, species, etc., etc. Typically, D&D like hand waves this by giving you common, which basically everybody speaks. I think that's kind of lazy and unfun, but... Most people just say there's a common language that everybody knows. And then there's secret languages like Elven and uh, Dwarven and Thieves Camp. Uh, I don't like common. I think there should be like regional languages. Like if you have a, let's say you've got a city and it's called, uh, let's say there's a language for South Elysium. Like it's Southern Elysian. And then there's Western Elysian. There's Xenocunian. Uh, that kind of stuff, I think that's more fun. Um, and then you could break that down even further into like, uh, let's say there's Lizardmen Xenocunian, uh, which is different from like Human Xenocunian, right? So you've got like Hiskin Xenocunian versus like uh, Human Xenocunian. And dialects, dialects are fun too, yeah. I've never played Exalted, I wouldn't know. Lizardmen? Gerard? Maybe. I think Gerard would be like a half lizard man if that's even possible. Haka Xenocudian versus Shinri Xenocudian? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Uh, but anyway, languages are typically determined by your race. So like, for example, um, GB here would probably speak common, orc, and then a uh, bonus amount of languages equal to intelligence, which is zero. So common and orcish, maybe goblin. 
Uh, don't worry too much about it. What if you have a character that is mute or can't hear and uses ASL? You would write down ASL. Well, it wouldn't be ASL because it's not American Sign Language. It would probably be just like sign language. Uh, it would probably be local to their area because sign language wouldn't have a way to spread globally like the internet. So you'd probably have a system of signs that is dedicated specifically to the region that you're in. You would probably want to teach it to your party as soon as you could. Yeah, you could say common sign language if common is a thing in your setting. So CSL. That language rule sounds like a pain to deal with. Most people don't deal with it. They just say everybody can speak common. Hmm. That could make sense now, now man, but no spoilers just yet. We're probably going to do Gerard or Octavio next, so we'll see. Let's just go ahead and say for now, uh, common and orcish. And you know what? Goblin. We'll say Goblin as well, because I want to. Ah, attacks and spell casting. This is, um, hmm. Don't worry about the spell casting side of this this much, uh, that much. This is more like a quick reference sheet for, uh, oh wait, I gotta do hit dice. Uh, hold on. Basically, GB has three D, 10, hit dice. What this means is that whenever GB takes a rest, GB can roll a D10 and recover that much HP. Cool? If GB takes a long rest, GB can just fully heal. Uh, you only get three of these. You get one per level. So you can only short rest like three times. Or you can just roll them all at once on one rest if you're really hurt. Does that make sense? Did he show us his dice collection? You've seen a lot of them right there, but I'll show you later. Let, wait till I put my gloves back on right now. My hands are very hot, so I'm not wearing them. Yippee! Don't worry about death saves. That's only important if you drop to zero HP. That's more gameplay than character creation. We'll talk about that some other time, probably when we're actually playing. Let's focus on attacks and spell casting. This is determined by the weapons you wield or the spells you use. In a ranger's case, a ranger starts with <clears throat> this equipment. Either scale mail or leather armor, um, two short swords or two simple melee weapons, a dungeoneer's pack or an explorer's pack, and a longbow and a quiver of 20 arrows. I think that's boring, so instead I'm going to say GB wields a heavy crossbow. So let's call that H. Cross. Oh, that mouse handwriting's looking real good. Real good. That looks like gross. Cross. Boom. Okay, so a heavy crossbow, right? Heavy crossbow, I believe, is 1d10, and then you add your attack bonus. It relies on dexterity for its bonus. GB is also proficient in it, meaning that we are going to take the bonus from proficiency, which is up here, and the bonus from dexterity. So that's going to be a plus four chance to hit. Right? And then the damage is 1 D 10. Awesome. Not bad. Easy peasy, right? He will never miss. A decent alternative to a sniper gun. Exactly. Exactly. Does his crossbow have a name as well? Probably Lorraine, I would imagine. Um, now this differs with melee weapons because range weapons don't get a bonus to damage from your stats, but melee weapons do. So let's also say GB for CQC purposes wields, let's say a dagger because GB wears a dagger on the hip, right? Now. That's a Pathfinder rule? Wait, ranged weapons get a bonus to damage from decks? Oh shit, you might be right. 
Ew. I hate that. But that makes sense, I guess. Okay, I lied. So GB gets a plus two to damage on uh, range rolls. Cool. Now the same applies for daggers. In melee, you get a plus four to hit. They do 1d4. And then the plus two for strength and or dexterity. Daggers are finesse weapons, so they can use range or, they, or dexterity or strength, right? Right. Okay, so I'm going to put my glove on, and I'm going to show you what I mean by this. Yeah, dex is super broken in 5e. That's true. That's very true. Dexterity is probably the most important stat in the game. So, let's say that GB is fighting somebody. GB wants to um, use the, the heavy crossbow. As long as GB is in range to attack them, I would say, roll your d20 to hit. I rolled a d20 to hit. GB rolled a 19. GB adds the plus four for the attack bonus, making that a 23. At level three, that's probably going to hit fucking anything, period, that he could be fighting. So then I would say, roll your damage dice, right? Which in this case is a D10, which is two. And then you're going to add your plus two for the dexterity modifier. So he did four damage. So D&D &D runs on a roll to hit, then roll to do damage system. That means anytime you want to attack somebody, first you need to roll, which is going to do the D20, and you have to beat their armor score, which is up here at the top, right? And then you roll damage, which subtracts from their HP. It's that easy. It's not as complicated as it sounds, I promise. So does everybody understand now? We understand D&D. &D. Last thing I need to do is determine what armor Goldie's wearing, and I'm going to say Goldie's probably wearing scale mail. Or no, I guess Goldie wears leathers, huh? Leather cloth, leather jacket, etc., etc. Let's roll over to our equipment page and see what that does. We already have our HP, no problem. So, leather armor. GB has leather armor, which is going to be 11 plus dexterity. Why is armor difference important? Because it is a flat number, and then you add your dexterity modifier. However, it only goes up to a certain amount based on the armor you're wearing. Some armor is so heavy, it slows you down, right? So you can't actually use that much dexterity to dodge out of the way. The reason dexterity applies to armor is because it's assuming that you're fast enough or dexterous enough to get out of the way of an attack. So a person in like leather has 11 plus their dexterity, right? So that's 11 plus two for GB, which would be 13. So if you have a high enough dexterity, sometimes it's better to wear lighter armor because you just get such a huge bonus from dodging out of the way rather than the heavy armor, right? Some are so heavy that they don't add dexterity at all. So you might say to yourself, why would I ever wear heavy armor? Well, you might be like a, a barbarian, or let's say a paladin, right? Who has a plus zero in dexterity. You're not dexterous, but you're very strong. Well, then you wouldn't want to wear light armor because you get a plus nothing. You want to wear the heaviest armor you can for the highest flat bonus you can get. So you'd probably be wearing full plate mail because that gives you an 18 armor. And then you'd probably use a shield because that gives you another plus two, putting you at 20 armor, which is very high. Pretty awesome, right? Let's go ahead and say GB wears scale mail for the sake of argument. He wears scale under his armor, which is going to be a 14. Plus dex, which is plus 2. Which is good, because scale mail only allows a maximum of up to plus 2 for the armor. So now we know that GB is at a 16 in armor score. Meaning... Anytime someone attacks GB with a physical attack, they have to roll higher than 16 to take any damage to his HP, no matter what, if he's if they don't roll higher than 16. Cool? Cool. Now we understand. So GB is a ranger. Yes, GB is a ranger currently. The last thing I need to tell you about GB, this is going to be important, is that as a ranger, GB does technically get some spells. GB knows three level one spells that are all specifically from the ranger list. 
I'm not going to go that far down this because that takes too long. Just know that GB knows a little bit of magic. Do I play Encumbrance? No, because it's too hard to keep track of. In a different game, I definitely would. But in D&D, I do not. Oh, he hiccuped. My bad. See you later, Moon Pie. I love Encumbrance and Managing Supplies, but I'm insane. I think if you played it as a, more of a survival game, Encumbrance and Managing Supplies would be a ton of fun. But most people play D&D as heroic fantasy, so I think that it struggles in that way. Um, I think D&D itself is not suited to survival anymore. I think maybe 1st Edition and possibly 2nd Edition. Okay, so since Rangers know spells, let's go ahead, go ahead and say GB knows the spell Hunter's Mark, which makes it so that enemies take more damage from ranged attacks, basically, if I remember correctly. Uh, GB knows Rain of Arrows, which makes it so GB can make an AoE of arrows on the ground. So instead of just shooting one target, GB can essentially fire a bunch of bolts or arrows into the air, and they'll hit, like, enemies in a 2x2 two two square. So enemies in, like, a 10-foot radius, right? Uh, and let's say GB knows... Piercing shot. Or Goodberry. Goodberry is really good. You know what? GB's a cook. So to represent cooking, GB knows Goodberry, which is the ability to summon eight berries that heal your team by one HP, but they feed you for the entire day like, like elvish limbus bread, right? So your team never has to eat, basically. Bam. That's GB. It is an OP spell. Definitely. Oh, diameter. There you go. Can you change good berry to meat instead? I really, 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 really wish you could. I would not want to survive on berries. I want to survive on meat. Well, I've already eaten three. Themed as good meat? Mmm, delicious. I would, in a survival game, Rizzy, I would ban Goodberry outright. No, no questions asked. 100%, I would just ban it. Mmm, Meatberry. GB stands for Goodberry. Exactly. Hunter Owl, welcome in. That good meat. Dino Raid. Did I get Dino Raided? Huh? Did I miss it? Did I not see it? Oh, you're early. You're dino rating early, aren't you? Onion breath raid. Are we sure? Where? What would you say is your favorite ranger subclass? Probably Beastmaster, but I don't really play ranger a lot. Personally, when I play ranger, I try to play them more survivalist. So, no, I guess not Beastmaster. Maybe Gloomstalker, but flavored outside the Underdark. Or... Uh, maybe Marksman, I guess. Is Marksman a subclass of Ranger? I can't remember. Or no, that's a fighting style, right? I gotta wait for this dino raid, and then we'll talk a little bit more about- There we go! Welcome in, you stinky little dinosaurs! Hello, Gerard. How'd it go? How was your stream? How was your delicious onion? I'm sure you enjoyed it, right? Right? Thank you for the Gerard! Welcome to Ger Gerard Sick Park. How's it going, gamers? How was our onion eating stream? We're nerding out in here. He hated the white onion? You big baby. It was something. Hi. Hi. We're nerding out with D&D. &D. We're rolling dice and stuff. Right now, we're still on GB's character sheet. It's taking me way longer than I thought, so we're going to speed run the next few. Don't worry. We're going to be a lot faster. Mmm. Red onion. Oh, he liked the red onion. Okay. Okay, that's character development. That's good. That's good. We'd love to see it. Please don't smash the red onion. We no 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 don't 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 smash the red onion. Just just eat the red onion. Just eat it. 
I don't think you would enjoy smashing any onions, trust me. That sounds like a bad idea. I think Berserker Barbarians are cool, but they need a buff. What the hell is happening? Why am I getting raided so much? Welcome in, Shinri and the Koi Panions. Thank you for the raid. How'd your stream go? What'd you get up to today? We're nerding out in here. I'm playing, not playing. I am explaining D&D, making character sheets for the Armist Boys. We are currently on Gold Bullet, and we're rolling dice, as you can see. How'd your stream go, Shinri? What'd you get up to today? Oh, wait, there's probably ads, actually. Now that I think, asking them what they got up to right away is probably a bad idea. How is the Zatsu, Koi Panions? What do we do? Getting Nihongo Jozu'd by ghosts? The usual... <laughs> oh, yeah? You were doing a Zatsu Don and you still got Nihongo Jozu'd by a ghost? How the hell does that work? Oh, we were using a Japanese Luigi board to riz go... Oh, okay. So you were like, please... If you're here right now, tell me, ghost, are you ka wa e? <laughs> Sorry, I, dro I knocked my dragon down. Check out my little dragon, my little green dragon. Isn't he cute? Exactly. Okay, I get it. I understand. Speed dating, but for the supernatural. On it. No problem. Great. I'm glad we uh, all have figured out how to use a uh, Luigi board as like an otherworldly version of Tinder. Uh, how does swiping right on the Luigi board work exactly? Do you just be like, hey, ha, ha, ha. what's up, ghost? Uh, do you like long walks on a beach? And they just like fucking flip the board upside down. <laughs> I did not paint that dragon. Spending two hours in character creation is actually very normal. That's true, but I do think it creates an intimidating... Um, roadblock for people that are new to DD. i promise this is a lot quicker when you're not sitting here doing stream content and explaining everything you can knock out a character in like an hour if you want to you don't have to sit here for two hours and like stress over this shit especially if you're making a rogue or a fighter or things like that okay okay oh the ghost swipes and then you die oh yeah that checks out actually that checks out <laughs> well in that case you die and then it's shit that might mean a yes if the ghost swipes you and you die. That means you are now a ghost, which means you got might be able to go on your first ghost date. Very cool. Very nice. I'm teaching how to make characters in D&D &D and how D&D &D 5e works. Uh, it's a lot simpler than it looks, I promise. Uh, watch the VOD if you want to understand it. <laughs> I will speed run the next sheet. Uh, you know what? I'll probably do me next since I'm probably going to be a full physical class. Uh, so I could speed run the sheet and show you how quick you can do it. Does that make sense? Cool. We already talked about what spells Goldie would have. The last thing I need to talk about is going to be Goldie's subclass. So at level three, most classes get a subclass, which helps to give them even more flavor and differentiate them even more. So let's take a look back at Ranger and talk about their level three subclass. Uh, somewhat curious, what is your least favorite class to play? Mine's Monk, like the concept falls off power-wise. Uh, conceptually, I dislike Monk the most because it just doesn't appeal to me. I don't, I've never really been like the, the martial arts master thing. I just, I like weapons more than I like hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, Gameplay-wise, I like every class. I, I, I don't think there's anything that would fall off for me. So, let's talk about being a ranger. Besides determining your starting equipment and your HP and your, like, uh, you know, abilities, your class is going to determine your flavor for the rest of the game. For example, at level one, rangers get a favored enemy and they get the ability Natural Explorer. Let me explain that real fast. Natural Explorer makes it so that difficult terrain never slows you down in your chosen environment for you or your group. Your group cannot be lost except by magical means, meaning you'll never get lost. You always know where you're going. Uh, when you're engaged in another activity while traveling, you're still alert to danger. So despite like being distracted by looking for food, uh, looking at a map, um, tracking other enemies, stuff like that, you cannot be 
um, like caught unawares. Like you are still alert to the danger around you, right? If you're traveling alone, you can move stealthily at a very normal pace, meaning you don't get slowed down by trying to stay stealthy. Um, what, when you forage, you find twice as much food in your chosen environment. And while tracking other creatures, you will learn their exact number, how big they are, and how long ago they passed through the area. Very flavorful, very fun. It's cool, but uh, not super useful in most campaigns, unfortunately. The baseline player's handbook, Ranger as written, does not have the best starting abilities. So it is what it is. Let's go ahead and look at favorite enemy, though. Favorite enemy is pretty cool because it gives you advantage on, like, understanding the enemy, finding out their weak points, knowing about them with, like, knowledge checks. And it also gives you uh, the ability to speak one language of your choice that is also spoken by your favorite enemies and gives you a couple other bonuses later on down the road, depending on what your subclass is. Um, so actually, favorite enemies, humanoids, doesn't uh i don't think that counts i don't think you're allowed to choose that you could choose between aberrations beasts celestials constructs dragons elementals fey fiends giants monstrosities oozes plants undead or you could choose two different humanoids so instead of picking humanoids as a whole you could pick like um orcs or gnolls or humans specifically I recommend picking humans. You're probably going to fight a lot of human bandits. Fight, fight humans. <laughs> so I'm going to say uh, GB's favorite enemies are humans and goblins. Say humans and goblins. There you go. Boom. Insectoids would probably fall under beasts or monstrosities, depending. I could also say GB's favorite enemies are corruption beasts. Okay, so there we go. We've got that settled. Let's go ahead and say fighting style. Fighting style is at level two. So rangers get the ability to pick a style of fighting that they're very good at at level two. You could choose between archery, defensive, dueling, or two weapon fighting styles. That basically means you're better at ranged fighting uh, being a bit more of a tank and getting hit less. Dueling is when you fight with one weapon in one hand and no weapon in the other hand. And two weapon fighting is when you're fighting with one weapon in each hand, right? We're going to go ahead and give GB archery. GB is the sniper after all. So that just means that GB always gets a plus two to every attack made with a ranged weapon. So you remember how earlier we talked about GB using the crossbow to attack? We said that GB gets a plus four. But actually, GB gets a plus six when attacking with a ranged weapon because it's plus two from dexterity, plus two from proficiency, and then you get plus two more for the archery fighting style, right? Very cool, very fun. So GB is very, very likely to hit a target when fighting at a range. I would argue corruption beasts are somewhere between monstrosities or aberrations, but it's hard to say. They could also be considered oozes in some cases. All right, we already talked about how GB gets spells, and at level three, he has three total spells, so now we know what spells he knows. And last but not least, we get a ranger archetype. Now, this is your subclass, right? Right? Unfortunately, rangers only get two subclasses in the PHB. Subclasses, think of them like splits on the skill tree of a class. So you can go hunter or beastmaster in baseline um, PHB, player's handbook, right? Without any mods or extensions or extra books. I'm going to say hunter. And hunter is basically just a better fighter where Beastmaster gets a companion that follows them around. It can fight with them and for them. So in GB's case, if GB went Beastmaster, GB would probably get like a hawk and use Bubby, right? Like Bubbies as the hawks. Um, this would give GB a companion that can help harass enemies um, and kind of take turns alongside GB. But Beastmaster and PHB is actually 
really bad, so we're not going to do that. We're going to go ahead and say that GB's a hunter. You don't need to worry too much about the subclass. Just know that it changes the flavor entirely, and they get special abilities every couple levels. So at third level, when you first pick hunter, you can pick between three special abilities. Colossus Slayer, Giant Killer, or Horde Breaker. I think GB would take Colossus Slayer. Why? Because check this out. Colossus Slayer makes it so that anytime you hit a creature that is not at maximum HP, it takes an extra 1d8 damage. Let's imagine GB is fighting a creature that is exactly as powerful as he is. So it has 16 armor, 23 HP. GB attacks at a range. GB rolls 19. GB gets a plus 6 to hit, right? So GB definitely beats his 16 armor. So we know GB hits. Now, if this creature has already taken damage, let's pretend it took 3 damage and it's at 20 HP, right? GB does 5 damage plus 2. That's 7. And on top of that... Oh no, I lost my D8. On top of that, GB gets to add a D8 to the damage. So we add another three. So every time GB hits, he's almost doing double damage. He gets a D8 and a D10 as long as they're not at max HP. That's pretty wild at low level. Very fun, very strong. If you add in the spell Hunter's Mark, you're doing even more damage. That's another D8. So then you would be doing on one shot D10, which, okay, we're going to reroll that because I think that's a yucky one. 10 damage plus 2, that's 12 damage, bringing him from the enemy from 20 HP down to 8 HP. You roll the D8, that's 7 damage. It's at 1 HP. Hunter's Mark adds another 8 damage, 7 damage. In one turn, GB just did 12 damage. Plus 14. GB would have one-shot himself in one turn. So, pretty fun. Pretty interesting. You can see how, even at level 3, with very limited options, you can start to stack really interesting builds on top of each other, right? Like, really cool stuff. A lot of flavor. It doesn't have to be that way, right? You could switch it up. Like, let's say GB didn't want to do Colossus Slayer. GB, maybe GB specializes in suppressing fire, handling lots of enemies at a time, right? Maybe at level three, instead of taking Colossus Slayer, he still goes Hunter, but he takes the ability Horde Breaker. Horde Breaker makes it so once on each of your turns, when you make a weapon attack, and this includes ranged weapons, you can attack another target with the same weapon as long as it's within five feet of the original target. So let's say two enemies are charging at him. They're side by side. Suddenly, GB can shoot twice in one turn. That's wild. He can really just start tearing apart things. Good AoEs. Exactly. Exactly. Fan that hammer. And then at level seven, if you stayed down the hunter path, right? You stay on hunt, you stay in hunter. You can pick up escape the horde, multi-attack defense, or steel will. Steel will makes you very resistant to being frightened. Escape the horde makes it so opportunity attacks against you have disadvantage, meaning that he can get away from melee combat much easier. Or he can take multi-attack defense, which is whenever a creature hits you with an attack, if they attack you again in that turn, you get a natural plus four to your armor. Meaning if somebody hits GB in a turn, suddenly his armor goes from 16 to 20. That's hard to hit. My favorite uh, class is Ranger. I use with one level of Barbarian and go Strength Melee. I use the Battlemaster just for the pet. Can give me free flanks. Hell yeah. Super strong. That's fun as hell. Yes, there's multi-classing in 5e. I'm not going to bother with that for now because it does get a little wild. The cool thing about Colossus Slayer and Hunter in general, is that it's not necessarily limited to ranged weapons, right? GB could do this in melee as well. So there you go, CQC. Bam! Lastly, at level 11, as a Hunter Ranger, you would get 
either volley or whirlwind attack, which are separated into melee and range. So you kind of have to make a decision here. Let's go ahead and say GB at level 11 takes volley, right? So now when you use your action to make a range attack against any number of creatures within 10 feet of a point you could see within your weapons range, you can attack all of them at the same time. You basically fire arrows or bolts into the air for every enemy within 10 feet. You have a permanent AOE attack. Pretty wild. In a given turn, you could hit four enemies with one attack. I agree, more like a volley kind of dude. Well, at level 11, you're going to have a lot of really strong stuff, men. I wouldn't say GB's too cracked. At level 11, you're going to have wizards doing things like throwing fireballs, which is a fucking massive area. That's like... I think a 20 foot radius, so twice the area of that, and that does 8d8 damage. So, yeah, that's strong, but that's not too strong. That's not like insane. Oh, sorry, it's a 4x4 area, up to 16 creatures. Still wild. Yeah, unfortunately, Rangers are kind of underpowered, especially in the baseline game. They did uh, later patch them, essentially, by releasing a, uh, a revised Ranger, which I would recommend playing with. I will probably play D&D with the Armors Boys at some point, yes. So far, we just now finished Goldie. We're going to say Goldie is a Hunter Ranger, level 3, uh, with a 15 strength... 15 dexterity, 12 constitution, 10 intelligence, 14 wisdom, 12 charisma, 3 spell slots, probably hunter's mark, uh, volley, and um, goodberry. Boom. Done. So, let's speed run a ruse sheet, shall we? Yeah, animal companion's really bad on regular 5e, so we're not going to talk about that. What's wild magic? Not important unless you're a sorcerer. Pathfinder 2E, I like it. I wish I'd gotten to play it more. I've played two whole sessions of it, and I've never gotten to run a game of it. I would like to at some point. Will I upload the character sheets anywhere? Maybe. I would want to redo it without the handwriting, so I'd probably go back and rewrite it. So, yeah, I would say so at some point. I'll upload them on Twitter later. Uh, maybe either tonight or tomorrow. Cool? Cool. Let's say GB makes his own gear. Why not? I am going to go ahead and handwrite the rest of these because typing takes too long. Oh, man. Do I have it in me to go through all four extra character sheets or would I just want to put those on Twitter? Hmm. How long have I been going? Two and a half hours already, huh? Ah. Hey, welcome to the Beatles Resader, Supreme Kai's. Well, Inaki, sometimes you can just find people to play with online. Do half today and half later? Oh, I could do that. I could do that. It's because I'm so powerful at pronouncing names. I am also explaining to chat. That's true. I'm going to watch the VOD for learning purposes. Good. You know what? Let's just keep it moving. Let's go ahead and we're going to handwrite the rest of these. Uh, so I'm going to real quick grab another little whoop, sheet and move it up. There we go. Uh-oh, what is this? You know what? I'll probably have strength. So let's go ahead and say this character's name is Ruse. Uh, we're going to be a... Believe it or not, a fighter. Wait a minute. Am I going to be a fighter or a barbarian? Hmm. Hmm. Hold on. Let me double check something. I want to check one thing.
Why not both? Because we're not multiclassing right now. I could definitely see Battle Master Fighter for sure. Mmm, I'm cooking, I'm cooking. Bambi, thank you for all those delicious member chips. I'm yum, 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 yum. We're doing PHB right now, gamers. Do I rage? Um, if you can count cackling and having a really good time and laughing my way through every fight, yeah, I rage. Unless you piss me off. But you'll know when I'm mad when I stop laughing. When I get focused. If I'm not laughing, then I'm raging. Nah, I'd rage. <laughs> the problem I have with barbarians, right? Is that they... They have a natural proclivity for, like, being part of the natural world. They have a sort of naturalistic vibe to them, which is cool. I like the natural world, but I don't think I have, a, like, a connection necessarily to nature. I don't have, like, a primal path necessarily. Um, do I like weapons too much to be a barbarian? Am I? No, I'm not. I'm not a half demon. I'm just a regular human. I'm a regular average human. Why would you? What? What? <laughs> you're so you're so silly. You're so funny. Nah. What? You guys are so weird right now. Anyway, uh, I would be a totally normal human fighter. Definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why do I feel gaslit? What are you talking about? Tiefling? Boo! What do you think? I'm an edgy... I, I, I didn't get into D&D &D through Critical Role. How dare you assume I'd be a tiefling? <laughs> Langschneck. That's a really cool flavor for a barbarian. I like that, actually. Oh, they did add the wild magic rage. That's kind of fun, actually. That's kind of fun. I do like that. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Vox Machina had zero tiefling, sir. Oh, sorry, have you gotten a Critical Role Season 2? Ding. Great Weapon Master. Oh, Battle Master, Fighter with Great Weapon Master. Busted. I did see the D&D &D movie. It was pretty good. Night Wings! Are tieflings edgy? You could play a tiefling. It's fine. There's nothing. Play what you want. Nothing's cringe. Before it was tieflings, it was everybody played elves. And before everybody played elves, everybody played humans. And after tieflings, it was everybody played... Or after elves, it was everybody played tieflings. And now with Baldur's Gate 3, everybody's going to play dragonborn warlocks. You're all right. It's okay. Don't, don't worry too much about it. Yeah, everyone was a drow before they were a tiefling. It's okay. I just like to clown a little bit because I do see a lot of new players coming to D&D and like you get like three tieflings in a group of four players, even though tieflings are theoretically very rare. You think Ganassi? Yeah, maybe. Hmm. -hmm. I don't know if I have a favorite subclass. Like I said, I rarely get to be a player. I'm almost always a DM. Uh, I would say my favorite subclass is probably Thief Rogue. Or... Mm. I don't know. Maybe Abjuration Wizard? 
Battlemaster Fighter. Well, I like Eldritch Knight. Too. I, I don't know. I don't know. We are currently in the look at me tiefling era. True. Oh, Mastermind Rogue's really cool, too. Anyway, we're supposed to be speedrunning this one. Hold on. I'm trying to decide between Barbarian and Fighter. Give me a second. Ooh, Barbarians do get Feral Instinct. I do have a Feral Instinct. Hmm. Hmm. Huh. Can I be a Barbarian with a less shitty Intelligence score? Is that a thing? There's no Barbarian Intelligence split classes, is there? Bummer. What if, what if we, we do stats first and everything else second? How's that sound? Rue's got that dog in him. Let's do stats first and we'll do a uh, class second. How's that sound? Let me just mark my page. My bones! I don't have any bones. I don't need those. Okay, so obviously we're going to put our 15 here because we're doing point by because I'm lazy. Um. Hmm. We got that low charisma. Hmm. Play a muscle wizard. Play a muscle wizard. Uh. There we go. Okay, easy peasy. Done. We got it, baby. What's a muscle wizard? A wizard with really high strength. Uh, so a fun and interesting way to play wizard would be to play muscle wizard and dump intelligence. Typically, wizards cast all their spells based on intelligence, but you could take spells that don't have an attack associated with them. Spells that are only utility, right? So if you wanted to, you could play a very high damaging wizard with like really strong like strength score. And only take spells that give you, like, plus to armor or make you bigger or uh, make it so that you can, like, uh, stun enemies or stagger them, right? So as long as you're not making rolls on any of your spells, you're still a really good wizard. You just don't use anything that's going to, like, require you to use intelligence, right? So like an Eldritch Knight, sure. Yeah, why not? War Magic Wizard? I don't know what that is. I've never checked it out. Wouldn't you have to multi-class into fighter to get more out of it? If you wanted multi-attack, yes. If you weren't playing all the way up until level 15, I mean, ah, you'd be fine. Play to like level 5, level 7, mm, level 8. Mm. You could get away with it for a while. No 11 in standard array, just 8, I think. Is that true? Huh. Well, I already did it for GB, so I'm just going to leave it alone and say it's fine. Yeah, Blade Singer's definitely the best way to do it. Because you could use Dexterity, and Dexterity's the most busted stat in the game, so... Uh, okay, now we got to decide between Fighter and Barbarian. I'm going to say... Maybe I would multi-class, but... Um. Man, I do like I do like variety. And unarmored defense is very fun. Ah. Uh, man. 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8. Ah, it's too late. I already, I already busted GB stats. I guess we're stronger stats than all you regulars. <laughs> I could flip a coin. 
I'll tell you what, we'll roll a d6. Even numbers, I'm a fighter. Odd numbers, I'm a barbarian. That was easy. I'm a fighter. There you go. Either way, this is going to be a very easy character to go ahead and run through. Uh, I'm obviously a very normal, regular, average human. I forget what humans get, but I think they get something. I think they just get a regular old plus one to two different stats, right? Isn't that what humans get? A plus one to two stats? Oh, a plus one to all stats! That's something. Huh. Twelve. Uh. <laughs> Man, now I gotta erase shit. That's fine. All right, we can do that. Hold on. We can do this. One second. One second. Fifteen. That's gonna be a sixteen. Oops. And I'm going to drop that to an 8 because I want to. <laughs> Beautiful. Negative 1. We get a plus 1 on this one. I believe this is plus, let's see, 10 and 11 are plus 0. So 12 and 13 are plus 1. So this is plus 2. Maybe I would swap these. That's all right. A one. Uh, 15, 16 is three, right? No, wait. 10, 11, zero. 12, 13 is one. 14, 15 is two. So this is three. Bam! It's that easy. Done. You love my handwriting? Thank you. I'm doing it with a mouse. Isn't it beautiful? Don't you love it? So, let's show you how quick you can go through a character sheet. Fighters are proficient in... I have, I have a plus two proficiency. Fighters are proficient in uh, strength and constitution. So, on my constitution saving throws, I would get a three, because it's my proficiency, which is plus two, you remember, and my constitution, which is one. My strength is plus three, plus five, so I get a plus five on strength saving throws. I'm going to be very hard to push around. Not Cran? Not today. Uh, two in dexterity. We get a... You know what? I am going to switch these. I'm going to say I have a 14. And, uh, yeah, we'll swap these. We'll swap these. This is now a 14. And this is a 13. What did I, I? I'm an idiot. Maybe I don't deserve the plus two in intelligence. Bam! That easy. Okay, so we get a two, we get a one, and we get a negative one. Cool. Done. Done! I always love playing as a Goliath of Fighters so you get a D12 plus con mod reaction to lessen damage. Busted. From a 13 to a 13. All right, so fighters get to pick between. Um, They get all armor, all shields, all weapons, and their skills are two skills from acrobatics, animal handling, athletics, history, insight, intimidation, perception, and survival. I think my perception's pretty good. Um, But so is my insight. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. 
So is Maya. Hmm. You know what? We'll take insight and perception. Fuck it. We'll do it live. So those are my two skills I've had, I have proficiency in. So now we just go down the list. This is two. This is one. This is two. This is going to be a three. This is going to be a negative one, which is a lie because I'm damn good at deception. But that's fine. Uh, this is two. This suddenly becomes a three because I'm proficient in it. Negative one. Uh, two. Two. One, two, three. And there you go. That's how fast you can go down the list. As soon as you have these modifiers on your stats, as soon as you get your stats set up and get your proficiency bonus and just find out what you're good at and proficient in, boom, you're done. That easy. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, intimidation score. It's true. Uh, so let's go look at fighters HP. It is one D10 per level plus your con mod. My con mod is a measly one because sadly I suffer my hot girl tummy issues. My my main defense is not taking hits. It is just not getting hit. These scars are because of my hot girl tummy issues. If you have a high enough dexterity, you'll never get hit. So let's see. I started a D10 plus con mod, so that's 11. And then on my first level up, I rolled a 7 plus 1, so we add 8 to that. That's 19. And then I had a 6 plus 1. We add 7 to that. So I'm now sitting at a whopping 26 HP is my maximum HP. Boom. Just don't get hit. Problem solved. So 26 HP, not bad at all. Uh, we do got to figure out my speed. I'm a human, so that's 30. Uh, humans do get a uh, couple other things. I'm not going to worry about it. We're just doing a speed run on this character sheet to show you how it works. My hit dice are going to be 3D10. You thought that was a PNG back there, huh? Ha! Psych! <laughs> I'm a very average, regular human. Trust me. De definitely just a standard, regular human. I, uh, I'm, I'm not fire resistant. I don't have any secret hell magics. Uh, I, 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 I don't get uh, advantage. on. I, I don't get a bonus to charisma. I have a negative charisma. I swear. I swear. I'm, I'm, I'm crimson. Rizless ruse. I've got a plus 10 on deception like every regular human. Don't worry about it. I'm a normal human. Uh, okay. So what do fighters start with? Fighters start with... Yeah. Chainmail or leather armor. Uh, if they take the leather armor, they also get a longbow and 20 arrows, which is actually pretty good. However, I'm going to start with chainmail because it's the best starting uh, heavy armor you can get. So let's assume I start with chainmail. I believe that's just a raw 16 uh, armor. I get one martial weapon and one shield or two martial weapons. I'm going to say fuck you to that and take a two-handed axe, which I believe is a 1d12. So we'll say G, which is a great axe. We add our strength modifier and our proficiency to hit, so we get a plus five to hit. And then we add plus three for our strength modifier on the back of that. Meaning, when I swing my great axe, I will roll a 12-sided dice if I hit. So let's say I roll first to hit. I rolled an 11, you had a 5, that's a 16. Let's pretend I'm fighting myself. In D&D, &D, if you ever meet the armor score, you beat it. The, the rule, the easiest way to remember it, is that rhyme. If you meet it, you beat it. So if I roll a 16 and the check was 16, I win. So, 11 plus 5 is 16. Then I roll my great axe. Boom, 6 plus 3, I do 9 damage on that swing. It's as simple as that, no problem.
I also start with a light crossbow or two hand axes. Let's go ahead and say I do a light crossbow because I am actually a pretty fucking crack shot. LC. Bow. I promise when I upload these later, they will be much better quality. So I'm proficient with crossbows and I get a plus two to dexterity. So that means I have a plus four to hit at range with that. Ignore that long four. They do 1d8 damage plus my dex mod. So 1d8 plus two. Bam. Easy as that. Now, as a fighter at level two, you get a fighting style. What does a fighting style do? You remember how Ranger had choice between archery, defensive, duelist, and two-weapon fighting? Fighters get this. Archery, defense, dueling, great weapon fighting, protection, or two-weapon fighting. Protection is the tank one. It allows you to help people as long as you're wielding a shield and they're close enough for you. Great weapon fighting makes it so anytime you would roll a one or a two on a damage dice for an attack, made with a weapon that you are wielding with two hands, as long as it's a melee weapon, you can re-roll the dice, but you must keep the dice. That's pretty cool. So, what does that mean? It means that if I roll a damage, and I'm like, oh man, I rolled a two. That's not a lot of damage. I could just say, ah, actually, I rolled an 11. Psych. Fun. Now I rolled an 11, and instead of doing 5 damage, I'm doing 14 damage. No big deal. Now, fighters also at level 2 get the ability to say, Fuck you, I'm not gonna die. They get the ability Second Wind. Only once, in between rests, they can just decide, Actually, I'm gonna recover 1d10 health, plus my fighter level. So I just go like, Oh, okay, you're, you're killing me. Oh no, I was at 26 health, and now, tragically, I am down to 16 health. Psych, I rolled a 10. I'm back to 26 health. Fuck you. I just take a big deep breath, go into my second wind, and start beating the brakes off people. Hello, Blob. Welcome in. S lastly, at level 2, fighters get an ability called Action Surge, which is basically, I get a second turn. You only get to do it once, and only once per rest, so it's not a lot, but it's kind of a big deal later on. And I'll explain why, because fighters go down a cascading attack pattern. I'll explain in a second. It's not actually a second turn. You don't get, like, more movement. That's fine. Uh, you do get an extra action, which usually means a second attack. However, I'll explain why that's really good in a second. Lastly, at level 3, you get a martial archetype, which is where you pick between champion fighter, which is the most simplistic fighter, and deceptively good. It is a deceptively strong fighter. Um, Battlemaster or Eldritch Knight. Champion at level three, if you pick champion, gets crits on 19s and 20s. Why is that important? That makes it so you go from 5% chance to critical hit to 10% chance to critical hit. Meaning that one out of 10 times you roll dice, statistically, you will do double damage. That's kind of nuts. Hey, thank you for those five delicious member chips, Alexandra. Om nom 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 nom. However, Battlemaster gets something called uh, maneuvers, which are basically spells for fighters. Things like disarm or tripping attack or goading attack. So you can get abilities that make enemies want to attack you or they get disadvantage. You can get abilities that knock the weapons out of their hand. You can get abilities that allow you to do a big cleave that hits two or three targets in a row instead of one. You can get abilities that scare opponents and give them disadvantage. You can get ability there's like it turns you into this like a uh, tactical fighter, which is really cool. Um I like Battlemaster a lot. I would probably take Battlemaster um, some people would say I'd be an Eldritch Knight because they claim they've seen me do magic, and that's a dirty, rotten lie. I'm a regular human who's never done magic. I don't know any magic. Uh, don't listen to them. Don't listen. Uh, I'm definitely a regular Battlemaster fighter. Okay, cool. Now, why... Early, you remember earlier when I said at level two, fighters get, uh, action surge, right? Why is action surge important? Don't ask about my shape-changing axe. How dare you? Don't, don't Just because Zephyr's amorphous doesn't mean you're allowed to ask about it. 
Zephyr's shy, okay? Zephyr, don't listen to them. It's okay. Uh, anyway, why is action surge important? So, fighter seems pretty boring right now, right? Like, oh, you don't get, like, uh, all these cool abilities that rangers get. You don't get any spells. You don't get a pet. Uh, you're mostly just, like, fighting in melee, blah, 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 blah. All right, check this out. Check this out. So, at level five, fighters get an extra attack. That doesn't sound like that big a deal. Except, it's not actually an extra attack. If I'm reading this correctly, let me double check. Let me make sure. Yep. So, at level 5, fighters can attack twice. There is a lot of classes in the game that can attack twice. However, at level 11, you can attack three times. And at level 20, you can attack four times. No other class in the game can do that. But the way it is written is not actually four attacks. It is four attacks for taking one attack action. Meaning, if you use action surge, which you get at level two, you refresh all four attacks. So at level 20, if I wanted to, I could attack eight times against a single target. That means in the span of six seconds, I would have swung Zephyr eight times. Easily. Deleted. So, assuming I hit all of those, I would roll eight of these. Eight D12. And every time I roll a one or a two, because I'm a great, ma great, great weapon master, right? I re-roll. Meaning, at minimum, I'm doing three plus my strength modifier. Which, at that point, might be plus five. So, at minimum, I'm doing eight damage. At maximum, I'm doing 12 plus 5 is 17. 17 times 8 damage, right? And that's assuming my axe isn't magical and doesn't do extra damage. I could very easily be hitting like 25 damage per hit 8 times. You'll almost never get to level 20 though, so don't worry about it. You can get a one on your second roll. Yes, actually, each of those attacks, even though it's one attack action, is an individual attack. As far as I as far as I remember, you do have to make an attack roll. So you have to hit eight times. It's not insane. It's not that wild. But it is still wild. Now, one of the best ways to do this would be to say, let's say you had a uh, heavy crossbow fighter who had a flying carpet. So you could always move like fucking... Uh, 120 feet away from your opponent while firing at a sniper distance eight times in one turn. Nutty. Let's say, bear with me, check this out, right? Let's say a wizard were in the game. Let's say, let's say little Timmy, our gnome wizard, is in the game and little Timmy says, hey, uh, you're a level... Let's say I'm level 5. Let's say I'm a level 5 fighter and I can attack twice, right? Little Timmy... Could, how long does it take to reach level 20? Uh, depends on your DM. Depends on your DM. Depends on what level you start at. I start my campaigns at level 1, usually. Um, it would take a very, very, very long time to get to level 20 because at level 20, you're essentially demigods. Like, wizards can cast the spell Wish, which literally lets them do basically whatever they want. Uh, fighters can attack eight times. Barbarians become essentially unkillable. Uh, you get a lot of wild stuff. Uh, at level 20, you're probably, you'll almost never play a campaign at level 20 is what I'm saying. The highest anybody's ever gotten in one of my campaigns was 12. And that's fine. Anyway, let's say I'm a level 20 fighter and somebody casts haste on me. That gives me another free action. I can now attack 12 times in a turn. Isn't that bonkers? Depends on what the ruling on that is, uh, Balink. Wait. Doesn't haste give you one attack action, what? One attack? Pathetic. Never mind. I take it back. I can only attack nine times. Pathetic.
Ooh, that's pretty good, Forge. I like that. It does specifically say one attack. Oh, I see. I see. Personally, here's the reality of it, though. I would never want to play at le 20th level. I do not think that's fun. I do not like that level of high super fantasy. I I prefer milestone leveling. I would rather my D&D campaign ends around level 10, maybe 14 at most. Uh, it is at a point where it begins to get so ridiculous, I do not enjoy it anymore, and I lose any sense of place in that universe once you get too high a level. Yeah, we don't do 10th or 11th level spells anymore. That makes sense, Big Bang Boom. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, also it becomes a lot of math once you get to level 20, which is very annoying. And trying to remember like all of your abilities and blah, 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 blah. And you're inevitably going to have some min-maxer who does take fighter and gets hasted and uses like nine attacks in a row with a magically enchanted like heavy crossbow that does plus 20 damage. And they've maxed out their dexterity, so they're basically unhittable. And they're using a magic card so they can never be caught. And it's every turn they're doing this shit. You, you, you probably don't want to play at level 20. That's the reality. I've never played at 20. I've just looked at the numbers and decided I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't think that I don't have any trauma about being at level 20. Don't get me wrong. Uh, that's not personal experience. I've never played at level 20. I just don't want to. Um, I feel like fights would drag on for so long or they'd be a one shot on either side. Like to challenge players as a DM at that point, you either need like the world's biggest HP sponge and that's boring or you need an enemy that could basically just kill a player in one one roll, which is annoying. And even then, your wizard's just going to cast, like, Dispel Magic or whatever. Counterspell, sorry. Honestly, Grace, I agree. I also prefer very, um... I guess I would call it mundane fantasy, not low fantasy necessarily. I don't mind like a good amount of magic in my setting, but I prefer mundane fantasy. I like like local shit, like dealing with, you know, a cave full of troglodytes that are like kidnapping sheep and stuff like that. And like minor like level threats, you know, like Robin Hood type shit where you got to deal with like an evil sheriff of Nottingham or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I like that stuff way more than I like world ending threats because it suddenly stops being relatable in any way. Once you get to the point where it's like, if you don't defeat this next demigod, they're going to end the world just like the last 12 opponents you beat. It's like, eh, I'm bored. I'm not interested. Now, if I'm watching a bunch of like fucking would-be farmers pick up some weapons and like a, an apprentice mage stumbling over his ass trying to cast like the colorful spray, spray to blind his opponents. That's fun. That's stakes. That's exciting. Well, thanks, Zen. I just want to be the guy, not the hero. Yeah, you kind of turn into anime superheroes at level 20. And that's fine. It's fun, but in your opinion, at what D&D level is Monster Hunter? I would say most Monster Hunter characters are fighters. I would say every Monster Hunter character is a fighter, and every single Monster Hunter character is probably a level 8 fighter. If I had to guess off the top of my head. Yeah, if you wanted to give it a range, you probably range... Well, I'd say you range from level 3 all the way up to level 12 at max level with a lot of magic items. Hunting Horn's a bard? Mmm, I guess so, sure. Exactly, Bing Bang Boom. Agreed. Can level 8s really take on Terrasque level monsters? Um, yeah, if your players are min-maxing enough, I don't see why not. The thing about D&D, and the thing about all TTRPGs, is once you realize action economy is the most important thing, you basically win. If you could, if you could control action economy, you win. If there's more enemies than there are players, the enemies have a significantly higher chance to win. If there's more players than there are enemies, 
the players have a much higher chance to win. It makes it really, really, really hard to run single big bad guys, right? Action economy, Tuna, is the idea that the, par the, the, the team with more actions in their turn in their on their side is gonna win right so like if you have to keep it simple let's pick the simplest class let's say it's a bunch of level five fighters you got five level five fighters so essentially on their turns all together those fighters can attack 10 times now let's put them up against a dragon that dragon is level 10 so essentially he should wipe the floor with them right he should kill them but that dragon can only attack two maybe three times Probably has to spread that damage between the fighters in some way. Maybe he gets a good breath weapon in that hits three of the five fighters. You know, a lot of cool stuff, but those fighters can second win. Those fighters can take potions. Those fighters can use their turns trying, turns trying to hamper it or slow it down, disarm it, give it disadvantage. They could surround it so all of them are rolling their attacks twice, essentially, to make sure they're landing higher. It's just the more times you have to attack in a turn the more chance you have to win. A horde of goblins is significantly more dangerous than two ogres. Guaranteed. Zen's right. Because numbers are the most important thing in tabletop, at least in D&D. Layer actions help to alleviate this, but I don't know that they fix it. Shirudu. Shirudo, rather. Sorry. Sh Shirudo. Uh, but I do think they help alleviate it quite a bit. Yeah, if your boss monster's dying too fast, add minions. Most bosses can have minions. Dragons can have, like, kobolds or lizardmen or cultists or baby dragons. Maybe they keep drakes around as, like, little pets or something. Uh, you could have a lich with a bunch of undead. You can have goblin chieftain with, like, a lot of little goblins that they call in. You can have, like, boss fight mechanics from MMOs. Yep, you could summon adds. Personally, I try never to have a boss that is just a slugfest. I don't want bosses that just trade hits back and forth with players, right? Like, I want my bosses to have interesting terrain or mechanics or things that make the fight interesting somehow. Like, my favorite boss I ever designed in 5e was a magically... It was, it was a... Okay, so there was a witch, right? Hold on. If you want them to have a good time, give them a big boss. If you want them to have a bad time, give them 12 kobolds. You're right, James Norland. So... My favorite boss I ever designed was at the top of a witch's tower. The witch was actually a spirit that had magically bound herself to a witch's hat. So if you wore the hat, she could talk to you telekinetically. She had been dead for a long time. Uh, think of it sort of like a spirit-possessed hat. Okay. However, she was not the boss. The boss was a magic golem she had enchanted. And at the top of the tower, there was a room of invisible walls and a hex grid much like a chessboard. Okay? Okay. She wasn't actually an evil witch. Anyway, throughout the entire dungeon, I had conditioned my players to touch these crystals. When they touched the crystal, they were disintegrated into little beams of light that fired in the direction the crystal was pointing until they connected with another crystal and then rematerialized. So I set up a couple puzzles where the players had to use the crystals to get over like traps or through like different like environmental hazards, how they got through like invisible walls to show them how the invisible wall system worked. Then when they got to the top of the tower, I had the crystals laid out in certain patterns so that they would end up in different parts of this, like, invisible maze, essentially. However, the golem could willingly move through the maze and had an action that, as a bonus action, it could pick one target and hit them with its enchanted glaive that could move them through the, through the maze as well. So they could essentially, like, push the fighter past the invisible wall, and then the fighter would have to go and find the crystal that corresponds with getting back into the fight. So the golem could willingly just walk past these invisible walls and move melee opponents away from it, while it kept pursuing the ranged opponents. Does that make sense? And then the players had to use their crystals to get around and try to stay in the fight. So I think interesting boss mechanics keep your game from getting boring. Yeah, the players had action economy, but a lot of that action economy was trying to keep up with the golem. I'm not sure how 2E handles it because I didn't get far enough to get into the meta of action economy. Crimson? Kingu Crimson. Crimson? Wait a minute! Uh, but I would be really interested in trying it out. Ever heard of the False Hydra encounter? I feel like I have heard of it, but no, tell me.
Am I going to be Dungeon Master as well? Most likely, yeah. Was I a forever DM? By choice. Yeah, I prefer DMing to playing. I get bored playing and I tend to switch characters a lot because I just get tired of the single classes. I much prefer like designing enemy encounters and dungeons and role playing. I like playing a lot of different characters using a lot of different voices. I'm not a voice actor like Gerard, but that's where I've gotten basically all of my practice. Uh, doing voices is just NPCs in D&D. Oh, the false Hydra, the one that makes you forget it exists and people keep dying and you have to figure out why they're dying, but when they die, they get erased from everybody's memory. That's what that is, and no one can perceive it actively. That's right. That is interesting, yeah. Do I have to uh, plan to have a stream for campaign writing? I would be kind of scared that my uh, players might watch that. You know, the other Hollow Stars uh, boys, I would be scared they might watch that. And uh, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil things for them. So maybe, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess I could make it membership only. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it was just world building and I never touched the stats on stream, I could probably do it, Rizzy. So the concept I had in mind was this. I want... Now, there's no promises here. This is what I want to do. What I want to do is I would like to, like, run... I would like to run a campaign that is sort of like West March's style where it's drop in, drop out, but the world is consistent. So any player in hollow stars could jump in anytime they want for any campaign. So like if Axel's available uh, a day and Altair's available that day and Flayon's available that day, they can just form up a group of adventurers at the adventurers guild, go in with their characters and just do a dungeon or do like whatever they want to do. Go talk to an important NPC, deal with political intrigue while doing that. I would also want to create a complex enough economy and world and system of like characters and countries that you guys could play as like maybe like a membership award. You know what I mean? Like maybe I could have membership streams where I talk about like how this country is warring against that country or maybe the necromancer is moving in on this territory and you guys can just vote on like who wins those conflicts. I don't understand the logistics behind that yet, but I want you guys to kind of be playing as like Think that you you guys are kind of playing like an RTS or a 4X game where the Hollow Stars boys would be playing in the world on the ground level of that. But I'd have to figure out how the mechanics for that work and how numbers work and how to keep you guys from playing favorites with your favorite NPC factions. So that would be tough, but I would try to figure it out. Exactly, Advent Wraith. Maybe they're trying to avoid a huge battle or something like that that you guys triggered. Like maybe, you know, okay, so Altair, Fleon, and Axe will go on their quest. They raid a dungeon and they they defeat a minor ghoul or ghoul lord or something. And when they kill the ghoul lord, the lich that had raised that ghoul lord immediately knows that it happened. It knows that their adventurer's guild is based out of like Orlando or something like that. So then that lich in uh, like in, in retaliation decides, okay, Orlando's got a little too big for its britches so i set up a conflict between like that lich and his forces versus orlando where maybe it attacks a minor farming settlement or it sends like it begins raising a bunch of undead dwarves in a mine to like ruin iron operations stuff like that and then you guys would vote on like who's winning that conflict so then the next time somebody plays maybe it's a uh, flay on haka Battle, uh, Gold Bullet, and Gerard who want to go on a mission, and they hear rumblings in the tavern or someplace about this, like, uh, like undead are starting to pop up significantly more frequently in this area, and maybe they should go check it out. They don't have to, because I'm not going to railroad them, but you guys would have directly created that situation and that quest line, that kind of stuff. Hell yeah, Eggman, I agree. Not the Great Depression, Samuel. <laughs> I 
That's true, Rai. I could do something like that. I'll think on it. I'll think on it for sure. Is D&D similar to Monster Hunter? I never played D&D before, but back at, uh, but back at my high school, there was an entire club dedicated to it. Think of D&D more like a blend between... Uh, think of it more like... Final Fantasy or World of Warcraft. It can be kind of Monster hunter but it's much more akin to, like, a long-form narrative starring a character that you create, right? And then you just go on adventures and stuff. It takes my opinion on DMPCs. It takes a very... It takes a very mature DM to run a DMPC in a way that isn't conflicting, but DMPCs aren't necessarily a bad thing when done right. I think that Gandalf is a DMPC. When used correctly and to serve the narrative and not serve the DM's ego, DMPCs can be fine. Yeah, I could possibly do that, Emily. That could work, possibly. Night, Kyle. Tau, DMPC is a vaguely derogatory term that specifically revolves uh, references characters that are very clearly the Dungeon Master's favorite character. Sometimes the character they would like to be playing if they're a forever DM. Uh, a lot of times people don't actually want to be the Dungeon Master or they wish they could be a player or sometimes they just want you to be playing as characters in their book because they're so obsessed with their narrative that they just want you to experience it and not actually play it. So, like, let's say you're a group of level 3 adventurers, your DM might suddenly introduce a level 12 paladin who happens to always be around and happens to always be saving you at last second and taking the spotlight and being the big hero and striking down the bad guys. That's the DMPC. In the right case, it could be very cool and very well done, and if not used as a deus ex machina to always bail you out, or if used as sort of more of a mentor or a guide character, DMPCs can create big stakes and really like broaden the world and make you feel how dangerous and threatening it really is. But most times it's handled very poorly. So it 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 takes a really, really good DM to make a DMPC work. I feel like the trick with using a DMPC to bail your players out is you have to establish the DMPC earlier and you have to give them motive, right? Like at the end of the day, if you want to create a sense of like realism and create a sense that the world is living, things need to happen without the players. I, I, am, I am firmly against the opinion that the players are the only important people in the world. Um, a lot of DMs will tell you your players are the main characters and everything should revolve around them. And if it's not them uh, making moves, nothing should happen. I very much disagree with that. The world should feel alive. It should feel active. Things should happen to the NPCs when the players aren't around. Countries should make their own decisions. Politics should move along with or without the players. But the players should be big, important, active players on that world stage to a degree. A DMPC can be used if they have motive to do something like that. But if a DMPC just whips out of nowhere and saves you for no reason constantly, that should not be happening. What about my sheet? What? What happened, Station? I'm done. That's that's a fighter. We did it. Fighters are really easy. We're done, baby. I will do Octavio and Gerard probably off stream. I think I'm going to wind down and chill out for the rest of this because uh, I'm burning at both ends. We're going to chill out, talk a little bit of D&D, &D, and then I'll probably call it my maneuvers. Don't worry about it. Yeah, Neku... <sighs> You don't have to be insanely good at improv to be a DM, but I find that that's the most important skill to DMing. I went through a lot of sessions where I forgot to prep at all, and I played it all by the seam of my pants. And for some reason, people still, like, my players still loved it. You know, like, if you're quick and you're smart and you always keep in mind what the overarching narrative is and what you want to happen and where you're kind of, like, guiding the story and you make sure that you focus on the players and their backstories and what it is they're trying to get out of it, I definitely think... That's what's most important. No part two. I could do a part two, maybe. C 
could I say the racing class for the other two? I would see Gerard as a dragon blood sorcerer. Gerard would be a dragon blood sorcerer. Maybe a halfling. Maybe dragonborn. Maybe half dragonborn. I'd give him half dragonborn. Yeah, fuck it. For this, for this specifically, I'd give him half dragonborn. Um, I would argue if you want to justify my ears, you could say I'm a half elf or an elf, but I'm not. I'm a regular average human. I'm definitely not a tiefling. I promise. Um, or a half tiefling or whatever the fuck. And I would say Octavio is definitely a very tall halfling bard. But I'll work on that either in part two or off stream. Hell yeah, C. Joe. Thanks for tagging along and thinking about the good soup. Octavio is a druid. Huh. Can you play D&D on all platforms? So the thing about D&D is that you do not need a platform at all to play it. You do not play D&D like a video game. D&D is a pen and paper RPG. As you can see here, I'm just filling this out on pen and paper. All you need is dice, like so. You need a D20, a D4, a D6, a D8, a D10, and a D12. They usually come in sets. You can find them in little bags like these. And then you can find a ton of variety in your dice, like you see here. Uh, Tons of sets, tons of different designs, and you could play in person, or you could play online if you want to on things like uh, D&D Beyond, Roll20. Uh, I believe D&D is coming up with a online uh, player specifically right now. Um, and I think Matthew Colville is currently working on making a online playable board as well. Tabletop Simulator is also good for D&D. There you go. Oh, and Foundry. Yeah, Foundry. Good point. Good point. Yep, 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 yep. Just look for virtual tabletops. Yeah, there you go. Personally, I like playing in person. It's hard to substitute, like, have, like having everybody get together, have some snacks, goof around, share some jokes, drink some soda, drink a, maybe a little bit of wine, have a pizza, et cetera, et cetera. 400 to 500 dice is a hell of a lot. Holy shit. Am I a dice goblin? Not really. If I see cool dice, I'll get them sometimes, but uh, I don't have like a strong urge to collect dice or anything. Well, Regal Masquerade, I guess it depends. Swarm of Bugs is a tough enemy because it seems like something that's really easy to deal with, but it's a deceptively dangerous enemy at level one. Uh, all the way up to level two and three, even, I would argue, especially if you don't know what to do with it. Um, my argument would be this. If they're just going to be passive aggressive about it, you probably don't want to deal with that type of player. Uh, but I would say, tell them you've made a mistake as a DM. It happens. You apologize and it won't happen again. If you don't want to resurrect the player or find a way to bring the player back, maybe there's a cleric nearby who happened to find their, uh, you know, bodies. Uh, maybe the swarm of bugs was actually an illusion and the player never died in the first place. Maybe there's like some wizard casting some really advanced illusion or enchantment spell that makes them think they saw their friend die to a bunch of bugs, but really the friend was knocked unconscious or teleported away. You can find a reason for that player not to have died, but that's up to you. They're level 12, then they shouldn't have died to a swarm of bugs. They fucked up. <laughs> Eat those dice, you won't. Personally, in my setting, as far as resurrection goes, I do not like resurrection mechanics. Uh, when I'm... The TTRPG that I'm working on is going to be pretty... Not low fantasy, but definitely a little bit more of a focus on survival and dark fantasy to a degree, which is going to involve either no resurrection mechanics, or if I do do resurrection mechanics, the way resurrection is going to work in my system is going to be specifically tied to soul magic. So essentially a form of necromancy. And the only way that's going to work is a splitting a piece of your soul into the person you're resurrecting. So if you resurrect someone, you each live 
half as long as you have left. And if either of you dies, you both die. Hey, thank you for the membership and welcome in Yukiki. So essentially, you would have to either pay a cleric a fuck ton to ever resurrect anybody. But on the other hand, suddenly clerics are very rare, very selfless, or very expensive and with a death wish themselves and very valuable. You might have kings who force people to learn cleric magic so that if the king dies, they can use the cleric as uh, insurance. But then that cleric has to be locked away for the rest of eternity and kept alive and kept from like offing themselves because the cleric can't be allowed to just run around and live their lives. That's too dangerous to that king, right? So you get this sort of like fucked up dichotomy where the king suddenly values that cleric as if that person is their phylactery, but they don't want them out there living their lives because that's too dangerous. I think that would be enough to balance uh, resurrection mechanics out a little bit. Minus one con per resurrections. I do like permanent stat damage. I think that's very fun. I also like the idea of diseases that do air quotes permanent stat damage, but only until they're cured. I think that's something that D&D doesn't touch on enough. Well, just don't resurrect people, Dragon Rider. The trick there is don't let them die. If you're a good cleric, right? <laughs> Have I watched Tempest's D&D? I did not, but I should. Well, gamers, how am I feeling? Let me think. Do you guys want to keep shooting the shit about D&D for a little bit, or are we burning out? How are we feeling? Personally, I've cooked my brain a little bit on both ends of it, but that's okay. It's on Vesper's channel? Oh, okay, okay. I haven't had a chance to watch a lot of Vesper's content, so I'd be interested. Eleven hours was a long stream, and I have been going for three and a half hours on this one. You know what? Um, you know what? Let's go ahead and say, let's call it for now, and we'll do a part two later. I I've enjoyed this D and D talk. I enjoy talking about TTRPGs. I could talk about my own setting for forever, but I don't want to because uh, then I'd be spoiling it. And I got to save that for if I ever publish it, which who knows right now I'm focusing on being an idol. So I don't really have like a lot of time to research, you know, dice systems and mechanics and things I would want to do. But I still like to develop the like interesting races and factions and cultures in my free time. I'll tell you about my, uh, my bipedal uh, carapace people at one point. It's going to be real cool. You'll love them. Hell yeah, you can eat. No problem. Think of it as soup. Give me just a second. It looks like Gama Senpai is live. Hell yeah. All right. We're going to raid over to Gama Senpai, gamers. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, that took a little longer than I thought it was going to to get through GB's character sheet, but a lot of that was explaining. So leaving this stream, we have to all agree... That next time I do this, we're going to go a little faster and explain a little less. If you want to know more about D&D, watch this VOD. Because I will not be explaining quite as much next time. Because I do want to finish both. But both uh, Gerard and Octavia are full caster classes. So it'll take a little longer to pick out their spells. And I'll explain spell casting mechanics next time. Okay? Okay. Cool. Thanks for hanging out, gamers. Uh, I'm going to get the fuck out of here tomorrow. I do have a stream. It is going to be WoW Wednesday. It's going to be my usual EU time. That is 2 p.m. EST for those on the EST time. Um, yeah, WoW Wednesday continues. I'm going to be playing hardcore WoW. I'll see you then. And then Thursday, I'm going to be participating uh, very early in the morning at 8 a.m. EST on Meriwether's Crab Game Collab. I will be there with Gerard and Octavio and a couple other faces you probably know. Um, I don't know who all said they're gonna be there, but uh, you might you might see some uh, some of your some of your favorite senpais there. You never know. You never know. Some familiar faces. All right, gamers, I'm gonna get the hell out of here. Say hi to Gama Senpai for me. Don't run off just yet. Um, stick around, Crusaders. Let's raid. Give them the Crusade.